We'll start by just acknowledging again our presence here on the land of the Wurundjeri people, um, part of the Kulin Nation, and not just taking that for granted, it's important that we genuinely do that, um, even though, where's it, Bundaberg, they're stopping it, Robbie? Acknowledgement to country? Yeah. But yeah, from our point of view, we just authentically acknowledge who we are, where we come from, and know how to behave in the presence of the people that we're crossing paths with on other people's country. And that's an important thing because um, it helps in your capacity to engage with humility, with dignity, with honour and integrity. That's important. Um, we've got another action-packed day today. Uh, I remind people of the code of conduct, but my head and heart always says that when we embrace the values of caring and sharing and respect, and we do that and we embrace that, you shouldn't need any code of conduct. Just treat each other with dignity and respect. No one's perfect. We're all unique and special. Hey, Leon. L-A-N. Um, and just enjoy your journey in life. Behave yourself, Alan. Apologies for the delayed start. Kristen and I were down reminiscing about winning the American Lotto um, and what we would do with all of them billions of dollars. And it was not about us, it was about what we could do for humanity, which was a good thing. Um, and the cool weather reminds me of the days that I used to breed racing deer. Yeah, you didn't know that, did you? I was trying to make a fast buck and some quick dough, but <laughs> had to throw in one joke. <laughs> well, I'm still broke, so it didn't work. <laughs> so, um, reminder of the, um, the purpose, showcasing the research infrastructure that you're creating in the Hass and Indigenous RDC space and the potential for improved research outcomes that it supports, with the desired outcomes being improved awareness by the audience and an ongoing uptake of the RDC infrastructure by researchers. Thanks very much for all the present presentations yesterday. Um, it's all, my observation was that we're just evolving. We're continuing to evolve. And I'll say it again, um, it's a kinship-led approach. Whether you realise it or not, everyone here is family and we're all contributing to the same end result. And when the family is struggling in one part, the rest of the family come in and build each other up. And that's what you've got to do in this Hass Indigenous starter space. Uh, and it's a journey. It is a journey. And um, you'll find you'll get pushback from different places, but that's reality. Welcome to our world. Yeah. Okay, so first presenter off the... The agenda today, I'm going to give you the, see and I'm talking about race and deer and fast buck, who do you reckon it might be? <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> Good morning, Jen. Thank you. Where's my thing? Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming back. Welcome if you if it's your first day. And, oh, look, there we go. All right. So, um, before we begin, I too would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional, traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet here today in Nam. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and elders right across this vast country of ours. I also would like to acknowledge any Indigenous people that are with us today here in person or online. Um, and I'd, additionally, I'd like to acknowledge Dylan Sara, the Goring Goring artist who's responsible for the Indigenous artwork that you'll see used in my presentation. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, 
I am Jenny Fuster. I'm the director of the HASS and Indigenous RDC at the Australian Research Data Commons. Okay, so yesterday I mentioned the ARDC shift away from open calls to thematic research data commons. And here you can see the ARDC's current strategy. The HASS and Indigenous RDC is one of the thematic research data commons that you'll see there on the left of the slide. And the ARDC's goal in creating the thematic research data commons is to create enduring and targeted data infrastructure that meets the research community needs. So for the HASS, the Humanities, Arts, Social Sciences and Indigenous Research Data Commons, this means harnessing research data to enhance Australian social and cultural wellbeing and to help Australia understand and preserve our culture, history and heritage. Okay, so I'm going to give you a refresher. What, for what is a research data commons? So once again, the term commons derives from the medieval European idea of management of shared land, and it was later popularised as a way of referring to shared resources. So for us, a research data commons brings together people, skills, data, and related resources such as storage, compute, software, and models into one system by providing integrated resources and easy to use interfaces, it enables uh, researchers to speed up their existing research and to undertake research that wasn't possible previously. Okay, so if you were present yesterday, you may recall that Inga Davis from the Academy of Humanities gave us a really excellent background to the investment in research infrastructure for Haas. And then I talked about the subsequent establishment of the Haas and Indigenous Research Data Commons. Wow, that was tricky. My text just went <coughs> We heard about the authentic relationships that we've nurtured across the RDC and the development of the framework for governance of Indigenous data, which has been called for and supported by all of our focus areas. We heard from Levi Murray and Kristen Smith about some of the inspiring work that the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities has undertaken over the last three years, including the pivotal work up in Yirrkala in the northeast Arnhem Land. We then had an update from Michael Hoare, Robert McClellan and Simon Musgrave on the Language Data Commons of Australia who talked through some of the data challenges in relation to language and how they are tackling them. Owen O'Neill and Tom Honeyman gave us an overview of the ARDC Community Data Lab and other activities in our Connections Focus Area. And then finally, Matthew Curry, Tomasz Zajac, I don't know how to pronounce his surname, sorry Tomasz, I was going to check with you this morning and I didn't and Herman Gonzalez talked to us through some of the work that has been underway to support social sciences research such as the geosocial demonstrator and the enhancing metadata for improved research in entrenched disadvantage pilot project. So yesterday we talked about the activities that we've undertaken over the last three years but today we're looking to the future. In 2023, the ARDC-led Hassan Indigenous RDC received the largest ever investment in Hass and Indigenous research infrastructure in Australia. The $25 million grant from the Australian Government's 2023 National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy funding round, along with co-investment from national partners will continue to deliver long-term, enduring national digital research infrastructure to support Hass and Indigenous research in Australia. As such, we intend to continue our support for the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities, Language Data Commons of Australia, the Community Data Lab and the Social Sciences. But we also have undertaken an intense co-design period in the first half of this year 
and can now announce that we're expanding the research data commons to include two new focus areas. They are the Australian Creative Histories and Futures, which is being led by Caroline Wake and Brioni Trezies at UNSW, and the Australian Internet Observatory, which is being led by Julian Thomas at RMIT. In our submission to the investment plan in 2023, we listed a set of objectives for seeking co-investment across the Hassan Indigenous RDC. And these objectives are capable people. So we want to develop a vibrant community of digitally proficient Hass and Indigenous researchers who are equipped with the expertise to explore and ethically use national data assets and other distributed research. Strong partnerships. Collaborative partnerships between institutional HASS and Indigenous data custodians across research, GLAM organisations, policy makers and Indigenous people. Innovative technology, access to cutting edge tools and distributed platforms that empower researchers and communities to use, annotate, extend and analyse HASS and Indigenous data effectively. Curated data, so we wanted to leverage state-of-the-art data science techniques to characterise data at scale, identify strategic opportunities for digitisation and ensure the discoverability of a growing knowledge base of high value, high quality data assets. And finally, collective governance. So a culture of trust and commitment through transparent problem solving practices, our collaborative approach aims to elevate and sustain capabilities within the Hass and Indigenous research data ecosystem. Uh, so you'll hear not more about our new focus areas today, but before we get on to that, we're going to hear from Isabel Saron, um, who is going to talk us through the decadal plan for research infrastructure, which the Australian Academy of Social Sciences has developed. And then we're going to move on to talking a little bit more about people. So you remember that I said, you know, in the definition of a research data commons, people were pivotal to everything we do. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we're empowering people across the research data commons and continuing to establish strong relationships. So I'll hand back to Grant, who will then hand on to Isabel. And thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you for coming along. Thank you, Jen. Hello, deadly sister. Hello, Lovely to see you. And may I also acknowledge you, Sandra, sneaking in. <laughs> Thank you, Jen, for handing back to me to introduce Isabel and Yamo. Vamos, vamos. Piano, piano. my notes ready. Is the magic button in the middle? Great. Good morning. Uh, my name is Isabel Seron and I'm here today on behalf of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia, where I work as a senior policy analyst. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today, to pay my respects to the elders past and present, and to acknowledge also any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Now, I'm here to tell you about our Academy's most significant research infrastructure undertaken to date, the Decadal Plan for Social Science Research Infrastructure 2024-2033, which we just recently launched in April this year. And my hope today that I'll confess from the get-go is uh, my hope is that I will convince you that this document is worth picking up and using to bring your goals and your aspirations and your projects closer 
to the goals and aspirations and projects of others in the social sciences and humanities uh, so that together we can accelerate the change that we want to see. So thank you uh, to ARDC and especially to Jenny for making space again for our academy um, in these conversations. Um, and in particular today, to have a, a space in this conversation about the future. And thank you also again to Jenny and Tom and all those other ARDC staff and has and indigenous um, ARDC project members who contributed to the making of the decadal plan either informally or for more formally as members of our expert working group. I was uh, thinking this morning, it was only a very year ago in the last symposium, I was here telling you why we needed a decadal plan and, and your help putting it together. Uh, that's, that's done now, the document's been published and, and we are here again and we're still needing your help, your support and your enthusiasm just as much or uh, dare I say even more now as we head into implementation. Now my plan for the session is as follows. First, I'll go over what's in the plan. I think that'll make most of the presentation. I hope I won't bore you. Uh, I'll go over uh, how it frames the future and I'll make an emphasis on those specific bits that I think or we think could be most useful to capability leaders um, just such as yourselves. Um, yeah, what, 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 I, what we think in there could be most useful to you. And then I'll go briefly into what the academy, academy envisages um, are the next steps now that the plan is out. And that third point about opportunities is just me saying I really like for this presentation to end in a conversation about opportunities, the opportunities that you see ahead, the things that you're most excited about, about the future. And I'll thank you in advance for your attention. So, what is the decadal plan? It is an advocacy tool. It tells the story of the infrastructures that social science researchers want and why it's a good idea to invest in those infrastructures. So it's a shopping list of sorts. But it also signals our sector has started the process of acting as a collective. So the subtext of that is the sector has worked out what needs to happen next over the short term to lay the ground for an envisioned future national ecosystem and that the sector is ready to move into action. It marks a shift in the balance of conversations we wanna have from mostly having conversations to justify why we need this and why we should invest to having conversations about how we're going to actually collectively make this happen. It is a powerful message, that one, to put out there. It's a message of confidence, of readiness. And it is also a powerful message to believe ourselves. I'm not sure that we do that enough yet. That we know what's good that we know what needs to happen, that we got this, that we're ready. And I think you are. I've, I've been involved in enough conversations over the past three years to realize that collectively, that you're ready, you're ready to go. Um, so how does the plan tell this story? What's in it? Here's the three basic elements in the plan in the order that they appear in the document. It starts with why, why infrastructure, and why you should invest in it. It then goes to what infrastructures we need or we want. Um, and the list of priority actions. And then it goes about to the questions of how. How will we, as we go, how will we go about deciding what to build and how to build it? I'll go over each of these next, but I won't follow the same order. I'm gonna start in the middle and go to the end and then work my way back to the beginning. So, um, yeah. Right about in the middle of the document, you'll find the action plan. This is the heart of it. And this is what is traditionally expected of a plan. Goals and some steps and, you know. Um, in this plan in particular, we've come down to three goals, nine priority actions and a subset of like little steps to get to those um, over time. Th that's a screenshot there of what the action plan table looks like. There's about three pages of, of tables <laughs> like that in the document. Um, now, how is this action plan table useful and I'd like to use an example to show you the ways we try to make this um, tool um, yeah, useful. So this here shows priority action 2.3 and sub step 2.3.1. Um, this action relates specifically to sensitive data, specifically to the kind of computational capabilities that the social sciences might need to, work, to be able to work with sensitive data. Now, the context for this is there are already a number of solutions for to do this. So 
Uh, you will know that ABS has data labs. Um, PHRN also has developed a solution to use um, for sensitive data in the health space. I don't know if there are such facilities yet for cultural type sensitive data. You would, you would know better than me. Now, any researchers who try to use these existing capabilities would tell you the, the problems they've encountered. And they're usually affordability, capacity, very long waiting times. And a problem less mentioned is that right now, even though there's like a, a really nice bunch of beautiful assets that you can link, currently you can only explore the two or so data sets you've been approved for. So it's like being two hand, it's like being handed two pieces of the puzzle at a time, but you not but not being allowed to see or to play with the whole, uh, the whole thing. And I, in my view, it, it does play significant limitations for the kinds of exploratory research that would, you know, be the mark of future social sciences. Um, so, altogether, the affordability, capacity, long waiting times, and hard to access to the whole thing, it's altogether so difficult that it is really not realistic to rely on these capabilities as they exist now for any workforce scale endeavor. Um, say, for example, if we wanted to train our PhDs to use these kind of things, we couldn't, couldn't uh, uh, the way they are now. So in other words, research methods that we would like to be the current bread and butter of social sciences are really only a reality for, for a very few. Now, I want to be very clear that this is not because these facilities hold something against researchers. On the contrary. These are pioneers. They are doing their best. They do it in goodwill. They often, they often run in a capacity and operate in a cost recovery. So it's not that. It's just that currently, they just don't, they're just not in the shape that we need them to be. Not yet. So with that context, I'll go to how we try to make this useful when we wrote the action to solve that problem into the plan. So first, we pull together the requirement of different corners of the sector. These facilities I just talked about, they, and the facilities we've, yeah, we have so far to handle sensitive data, they tend to be legacy of efforts to deal with government administrative data, data in tables, not, yeah, very structured data. So, but we, that's not, that, that's not gonna make us happy in the long term. We need facilities that can also handle cultural type data. Another example is we just don't need the data handling to be safe. It has to be safe to an indigenous standard. So we've made sure to write all of these requirements that so far haven't been within the scope of, within the eye, within the sight of um, the operators of these facilities to actually yeah, bring everything that needs to, be, to happen. So it is raising the bar for future infrastructures to meet the needs of the whole collective. If we are going to build something or scale something up, it should be to make it useful for the many. A second thing we tried to do was to make this, uh, to make this useful was um, we, we're trying to make the hard asks on behalf of the whole sector. So I'll take an example, um, the affordability problem. If individual researchers show up at a facility and say, oh, well, no, this needs to be cheaper or free, uh, and in many cases, affordable will mean free for many. Um, they're likely to meet with responses like, it can be made cheaply. It just, it just can't, it's very expensive to run. And they lose that fight every time. And the provider will do that rightly so because they honestly can't run it any cheaper. So instead what the plan's trying to do is saying, affordability is an issue for the entire sector. This capability is so critical to so many that it has to be made affordable. And it wouldn't be do so through demanding a price drop but it will be made so by collectively coming together to figure out suitable business and operation models, figuring out those so that we can deliver these capabilities at a, in a viable way. So it makes those hard, uncomfortable asks on behalf of the whole sector. And the last thing it does, it picks no winners. This action plan doesn't say, we need this capability and it will be delivered by organization X but it just says that it is needed. So anyone can pick up the plan and say, I will deliver this and kudos to you and a great day for the sector. I won't go into the details um, of the actions and goals in the plan any further because you'll hate me, but I'll do, I will give you the gist of what, what it's about. Goal one is all about 
governance infrastructure. So how are we going to coordinate this effort nationally and collectively? So that goal and the actions and steps underneath it in, that, in those tables are all about that. Goal number two is about setting sharing infrastructures. So the technical conditions for us to actually share and work together at that scale. And the last one is about investment streams. And I, I think you'll follow me on this one because I, yeah. Currently, every new effort to build capability has to find a best poke funding source. And it's usually a one of thing. It runs out quickly and then you're like in the limbo. Uh, that is tremendously challenging. It makes for very slow going and it's exhausting and it's stressful. Now, this will be okay if capability building was something that we were here to do for a short transition period. So uh, let's just endure it and, and we'll be over it. But capability building around data and software and skills and all these things, that's not slowing down, it's not going back. There's no, it's, it's, just, it's just forward and more every time. So this third goal risks some proposals for what a research infrastructure ecosystem with ongoing reliable funding streams might look like. It's, it's one of the more tenuous sort of areas of the plan, it's, 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 uh, but I hope you take a look and, and that you'll, I don't know, if we didn't get it right this time, we'll try and get it right the next. So that's the what of the plan. And we're very excited about all the actions in those tables, but we're also aware the space is very dynamic and we envisage, envisage that these actions might actually be only relevant for maybe another the next three to five years. Um, and even if those are picked up, they probably end up being something different. So in that context of the dynamism and uncertainty is that the next component of the plan was put in place and that is um, a set of five principles. Five principles to select and build fit for purpose infrastructure for the social science. And those are the five that we've identified. Where did this come from? These principles reflect all those non-negotiables I've heard from the sector through the last years. They don't describe a specific capability, but more of a way of doing things. These are the things that we want to see in, any infra in all infrastructures. So why to include them here? Because if priorities change, if we decide that this is not a solution but something else, this principle should still apply. So this is, this is us trying to make the, the plan change-proof, so to speak. And the other important reason to include this kind of thing in the plan is for whenever we build or we get in, in, yeah, involved in cross-domain infrastructures. So say, imagine the Department of Education were to invest in a new increase to handle collections across all disciplines or some other thing like that. These five specs would be the social science minimums. Other discipline groups might not have such strong needs for, for example, handling sensitive data or to share access and interfaces with community. It's just not it's relevant for their groups. So, but these are our must-haves. So this checklist here is telling anyone who wants to know what it takes to make infrastructure work for the social science. Um, and what is this? Yes, and finally, that, that is the fifth component. Why, why? The plan provides answers for why we should invest. We assume outsiders don't know all the exciting research futures we are cooking up. Uh, so we try to offer a sampler of those aspirations and futures um, as a rationale for investment. These are presented as four use cases, which are listed there. And we pick these four because they provide a good, yeah, a good sample of the variety of things we've got going on and we aspire to, but also because these are four areas where we expect to see a lot of innovation in terms of infrastructure over the next years. Notably, these are not case studies in the sense of, see how well we did this in the past, let's replicate this this case study. No, they are use cases. They present future aspirations of things that we would like to be able to do very well and then they drill down into then white capabilities are needed to be able to deliver on, on, that, on those uh, potentials. They're written in the key. This is what we want to do. This is why it's pivotal for Australians and these are the capabilities that they will need to help deliver that. These case studies are also, were also a, a way to, for us to demonstrate that the things that we include in that action list um, won't solve a problem for only a subset of the sector, but that they're critical across all undertakings. 
So, for example, the need for a national facility to handle sensitive data is sensitive, oh, sorry, it's uh, pivotal to all those four things. So we wrote that need under each of those use cases. And so you can, yeah, it, anyone who's going to pick up that action for all can say, we're not solving just the problem for the, I don't know, the sociologist, but we're solving it for this, that, 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 and that. Um, I am not, that, that's, that's about it. That's about all I'm going to say uh, about the contents of the plan. The only other thing I thought I should uh, address is um, the way we went about the indigenous questions in the plan. Um, so how we went about it was, in terms of participation, uh, we had one indigenous rep in the steering group, Jacob Prent, that was like the highest level of decision making, sit at the table. Uh, we wish there we had been more representations. Um, we had six indi indigenous um, persons um, nominate to be in the expert working group. And we, <laughs> I mean, I'm grateful for they were very patient with me. <laughs> So it's a thing, awesome. Um, the intent from the get-go get was to have indigenous issues, um, what do you say, displayed prominently in the plan. So it's one of our four use cases, indigenous sovereignty is one of the five principles, indigenous leadership. And we made sure to include in all those actions in the table, regardless of the, regardless if they didn't look indigenous specific, yeah. like at the start, but we put in every one of them uh, requirements for indigenous data sovereignty, indigenous data governance, and indigenous culture and intellectual property all throughout. Now, in terms of the actual aspirations or goals, we try to facilitate a goal definition exercise with the sectors of this. And we didn't think that that, was the, that, that that should be our goal with the indigenous sort of area. So basically, yeah, that's there to do. So our strategy was simply to relay what's being done, explicitly support those processes, goals and aspirations, and adopt them into the plan. So just paste it in basically as much as anything that we could sort of get our hands on, we just, just went in. I hope we did a good job out of it. I'm, I'm always nervous about, all, about it all. Um, the feedback has been good so far, but we haven't heard from everyone. So to those of you who didn't have a chance to participate in that process, we are open, we're listening, and we want to know what you think. Also, um, uh, as I listened yesterday to um, yeah, the ideas that were um, circulating, um, it is early days and we haven't worked out implementation, but I wanted to say that there's, there, there was strong support in the lead up to the plan and at the launch for that idea that, non, that the non-indigenous portion of the sector should take a lot of the heavy lifting but, and do it while respecting uh, autonomy in decision making. So that's what's in the plan. I hope you'll find, I hope you pick it up and that you'll find it useful to progress your goals. And please remember that it was not written for the benefit of any particular organization. Those hundred voices or so in the back of the plan, the people in our steering group and expert working groups, they're not there signing for themselves, but they're making a collective case for the sector. So the sector's backing you up, pick it up and, and use it. Now what's, what's next? The Academy is committed to championing the implementation of the plan, but we are a small organization. So just as we had to find funding partners to run the project, we now have to find funding partners for the next stage, and that's where we are right now. If you would consider becoming a partner, it's not what we expected. Uh, you're very welcome. Please reach out. Um, that's uh, our email there, and if you go to our website, you can uh, subscribe to um, updates or you can just email me, whatever. Um, so very, very keen to hear from, uh, from you all. Um, and now about the future, just to close. Most of what we have to say formally about the future is written either as a vision or as goals and actions in the plan. But if I may speak more informally about how I see sort of what I think getting to those futures might take, I'd say, um, and I've placed here a snapshot of the current social science capabilities we identified in 2023. We ran a stock take of what was out there. It's over like 900 or something capabilities. Um, then the, the two big blobs are the Bureau of Statistics and the National Library of Australia. And the rest is, yeah, those many, uh, many smaller capabilities. It is an imperfect map, so yep. But it does resonate with my understanding of our current state, um, which I'd describe as a, a long tail situation. Few big, significant, and many smaller spread out, yet to be more connected or whatever. 
Now, why should this look alike in the future? If, that, if that's what it looks now, what would, what would the ideal shape of that um, thing be? I usually hear federated is the way to go. What would federation look like for this particular you know, group of things? Where will the capabilities that you are developing here as part of the uh, Hassan Indigenous District Data Commons, how will they sit in that ecosystem? How will they change that, the shape of that ecosystem? Um, I, would, I would expect it to be like nicely reorganized after you guys sort of graduate. Um, and so what I wanted to say is that I think the dialogues that comes, come next as the sector moves deliberately towards a future direction will be very exciting conversation. They will be ecosystem shaping conversations, but they will also be very confronting, heavy conversations about change. Some change might be easier than others. Where's Michael Hall? Here, Michael, I'm gonna say something stupid, forgive me. So I'm an admirer of SDAC, like, which is why I so badly wished that you didn't look so language, so linguistics, because you're so relevant to the whole gamut of social science disciplines, like all of them, I would say. So, so some conversations and some changes will be easy like that. Something already being done so well, being done very right, that it just needs to take its rightful place in the ecosystem, you know, just its relevance being made more obvious to the rest of the sector. But other conversations will be trickier. For example, conversations about duplication. I was listening to a stakeholder recently um, say, the linkage space, for example, it's getting crowded. Should I continue to do linkage or should I move to develop some other critical capabilities somewhere else? Uh, and linkage is that example, but duplication is, is rife across that sort of ecosystem right now. Uh, and those would be hard conversations to have and conversations that we need to be willing to have and, and slowly make ourselves more comfortable having. Uh, the current structure is comprised of many small things. So joining capabilities might actually be you know, a critical strategy over the next years to achieve scale. I was listening recently to the history of TURN, the increase facility. They first became, I understand, they first became an increase by pulling together all the different sources of ecosystem data that was previously spread out across the country. Is something like that the key for you know, the social sciences crowning a new increase very soon? You know? um, so all in all, it's exciting times. There, there are hard conversations ahead. But we, as an academy, we are very keen to stay involved in those conversations, and we are very keen to have those conversations with all of you involved. I thank you very much. said at the start that you wanted opportunity yes. to see ahead. Yes. See? Up here. So, open. What are the opportunities moving forward? Are you asking me? Yes. Well, I want them to ask you too. Hmm. Going for bigger and putting things together. Would be my, it's like the, the basics of, yeah. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, I would expect that, that the basics have been sort of said in abstract, but it would really take the owners and the doers of things to figure out how they will happen in, in the flesh. I don't know how to say that more accurately. So, so it, uh, I only see lots of conversations to have yeah. that I don't know about and that, yeah. But then we don't want to talk for the sake of talking. We want to <gasps> see something. Oh, where are you going? Oh. I want to see what the foundation, the Milda House yeah. Foundation sits in the indigenous data, the country we're in, mm -hmm. and then we can start, but you've got to bring all the players together. That yes, be, yes. Yeah. It's not between you and I, it's you between just, any of us. No, but you, you just say the thing, you just say the thing. <laughs> so any questions? Mr. Bowler. I know I'm also in the Life Course Centre. Um, my question is around community involvement in research 
and really trying to close the gap between the very technical and the social dimensions of this. And I'm thinking particularly of when um, we were talking about government um, controlled administrative data. Mm. Um, and when you were talking about the goals around what infrastructure, um, you talked about sharing infrastructure. I think that's the second goal. Yes. And you said that that's, that's technical. And I was wondering whether you could just um, expand more in terms of the future, how we might um, create the enabling infrastructure for communities to have more involvement in the sharing of um, data and be more involved in, in, in engaging with these highly technical infrastructures. Mm. Mm. I, think, I think you might be overestimating my um, powers for solution sort of thinking. Um, what I would say is that uh, as far as as far as sort of the academy goes, it's because we're not we're not providers of infrastructure. We we, we don't know we don't know that game. Um, as far as we go, we've identified that need for um, how do you say yeah access for community and funding into community capability building as a, as one of those cornerstones like principles for that should be should just happen across the, the whole thing. Um, I don't think that we have sorted that out and we, it's, it's say for example in, in that goal to area of the plan, it's currently centered around getting uh, universities to agree, so that's, that's something we would really like to see happen, getting universities to agree to share data they hold amongst themselves and to um, fix those access management systems so that you don't need a, yeah, a credential to access data and then, but you know, Say, saying that is, is one thing, but yeah, I, I, I think that the plan goes as far as saying the sector needs that, but really the, the technical complexities and the, and the doing um, is, is something that the infrastructure sector needs to pick up on. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know if that, sort of how that, yeah, if that's been a satisfactory answer to the question. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have one from online. Um, thank you for a great introduction to this plan. I'm excited to read it. Could you share your vision for what this means for trainer communities across Australia, those people who have a role, paid or not, in upskilling research community to use this infrastructure? Yes, yes. Um, that's, that was one of the areas there was actually most excitement about in the making of the plan. Lots of comments around that. Um, hmm. Infrastructure for training. If I try to remember the point. So what, what's in the plan currently is that we need to sort out pathways for, I should probably go through the plan. Um, pathways for, you know when, when I, I don't know, I don't know if you've done this, when, um, if you're doing a course and you wanna get to, um, you're learning some, I don't know, machine learning skill or whatever, um, and they draw, well you need to learn this first, that then, da, 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 da. so one of, the, one of the things I see missing or that I've heard missing in the sector is to have some clarity around the different professional pathways that yeah, researchers could take to specialize in different, yeah, <laughs> areas. Frameworks. Frameworks, that's the yeah. thing. And, and the artist is actually doing like really beautiful work on that, um, Catherine Answer Farm. So, so yes, there's a lot of that um, that needs to be supported, but I, I, I would say the main thing, just um, just as it might be the main thing for um, data and so forth, um, there's, there's just that need for for funding streams to, to go into that kind of capability building. To, yeah, I don't think that we currently support that um, and we need that. And yeah, what, what I saw most enthusiasm was also around finding a, a place in the, um, finding a place for those currently providing training like the carpentries or the, the summer schools. Um, AXPRI does a lot of training to intersect 
well, so we've got really like um, all the elements for what could be a really nicely integrated, multi-layered um, training ecosystem. They're, they're kind of all in place, but there is no uh, framework pulling those together and, and finding yeah, a way to, to fund those things so that they're actually, yeah, really accessible and, and can be ongoingly kept up to date and progress the way they should be. So, yeah, this, yeah those are, I don't know, um, is that, again, it's all the right questions, but I, w I think I will do the sector a disservice if I pretended to have the answers. It is, it is really all things that wanna happen, but things that need to be worked out. That is going to be the very hard job that's ahead. Is actually working out how, how that will happen, and it and it, and it won't happen if just some academy comes and says, oh, "This is what you must do." But it, it the, the only way it will happen uh, proper is is by yeah having having those um, approaching all, all the, the current players, so yeah carpenters and whatnot, um, everyone and and figuring out a way forward. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the big drivers for us in the Anglicus family is that we're in service of the roadmap. Um, yeah. And uh, it's not that long ago uh, that the 2021 roadmap was mm -hmm. released in 2022. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering, sorry if this is an exceptionally mean question to ask. Oh, I, uh, I, was <laughs> like, yeah, uh, I don't expect any less. <laughs> where do you see the points of overlap between what you're pushing for in the decadal mm -hmm. plan and what's being anticipated in the roadmap such that we can work in alignment with the roadmap, which is something that we have to do as the Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons and also mm -hmm. all of the activities that run under it. We have to work in service of the roadmap. Uh, what, are yeah. the, what are the points of overlap that you see between your decadal plan and, and that very important document mm -hmm. for us? Well, because you memorize the roadmap, right? Of and course, you're just of course. Pull it up like that. Yes. Um, I was going to say two things. The first would be that we are very keen on getting involved in um, in those conversations leading to the next one. Um, I don't think we have had much inroads in the past, and so so we are we have to work actively on well, yeah, to put it bluntly, to build our influence um, in that space, and. This decadal plan was largely an exercise in, like it was doing us doing our homework so that we could show up with uh, something coherent to that process. Um, but saying that, uh, it was also an important, what? Um, the strategy, I don't know, thinking, vision, whatever, in making the plan that it wouldn't be a plan for the department, but that it should be a plan for the sector. So it, it is mostly about understanding and organizing ourselves and not so much giving home, like just, ah, oh, raise our hands, spend more money. Yes, but it really is about, uh, we, there's lots of work that we need to do and let's, let's just do it, let's organize, like, let's just take this seriously. Um, um, yes, so it is, it is written very much as a plan for the sector to mobilize the entire thing. And, but we hope, I mean, our, our wish would be that they just lift up the text and the action and just drop it as like um, whatever, but that's not how things happen, right? Yeah, I hope so, right? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Tim. We do look forward to seeing it in the footnotes of, of the next oh. iteration. <laughs> uh, Inga, here from your sister academy yes. at the Academy yes. of the Humanities, huge congratulations to you, Isabel, and the team at Social Sciences. This is obviously an enormous amount of work and a huge commitment from the academy to pull so many um, diverse stakeholders together and um, to make the commitment to a 10-year vision. Um, I guess I, I'm curious to learn from you or, or to understand from you what your learnings are bringing together. You, you showed the list of stakeholders mm -hmm. who have had yeah. input into the plan. Um, what are your reflections and learnings and, and bringing so many people to the table and, and galvanising so many points of view and ideas? How did you get to the point of creating the document? So key learnings, um, I guess, from, from your crowdsourcing. Oh. And the second part of my right. question is, have you 
introduced this document to any government departments or government officials and, and what has the response been? We, oh, oh my God, let me forget the, the first one. So we haven't done the, good, the full job yet of um, presenting. We did have um, a breakfast on the day of the launch with uh, yeah, key stakeholders from government organizations and we presented the plan. We also had some of those organizations already involved as uh, members of the expert working group. So we have been making inroads, perhaps not with all of them, but with the most keen so far. So, um, so I, I think that's going well, lots of work to be done. And um, anyway, um, now a big question about the learnings, Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> <sighs> I think it was, huh. We, uh, we think we're very different, but we're not. So a lot of the time uh, in, the, um, in the engagement, um, I, would, I would get a comment like, oh, that's not, like, yeah, so that, that's, not, that's not the big problem, it's this problem. And they were actually talking about the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I think, uh, I, and I actually, I wish that, the, to say the uh, the process had been longer because um you just need to work through these things um so say for example uh, <laughs> the 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 term we use for I, I first started with human data huh and then I quickly no it's like no what do you mean human data that's not, that's not the kind of data we care about it's it's culturally um, what do you mean sensitive data so it's like there was all this big thing about what we meant about and, and so we ended up with a very long Monica. <laughs> Human and culturally sensitive data that we plastered throughout the plan, however inefficient that was, but that was a way of making sure that you know everyone that really needed being were in. So, so I, think, I think it takes a lot of patience, it, take, it takes risks. Um, I, I have a way of proceeding with things that are, I don't hold the drafts, until it's perfect to publish, but I put out a very ugly draft very quickly, and then there's a barrage of comments that come back, but then you very quickly realize what's, what angers people, what motivates them, what, um, you know. So, so I'd say keeping the process open from the start, as in ha having early drafts out, ugly, ugly. <laughs> uh, having them out was, was critical to the process looking transparent and actually inviting input um, into, yeah, you know, early feedback, best feedback. Um, uh, I don't know, I, I still wish we had more people in the, in the SP working group. I wish we had more time to work things through. Um, yeah, I'd say that, yeah, perhaps uh, open and just, yeah, ha just patiently having those all those conversations. Um, hmm. Some some stakeholders that started um, angry, you know, it, it just it takes a call sometimes just to <laughs> dissolve that. Um, and yeah, and, and yes, and all in all, we we really all can do better together. And and it's not that it, it just takes it just takes uh, understanding. Yeah, sorry, I'm too long. What was the human and culturally sensitive data? Yes. So that's, uh, that's the term that we're currently using in the plan to refer to data that has some kind of um, privacy or yeah, culturally sensitive side and so that it needs, it, it, it can be open data that it needs to like a specific special handling and yep. Why don't you just call it culturally sensitive human data? You see? It's not big. I'll, can, I'll change it again, I'll change it again, change it again. <laughs> Uh, so I have uh, from Naomi Schwartz, uh, thank you for your presentation. In the short term, would it be helpful to find exemplar projects to work with to showcase best practice? Yes, oh, yes, 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 absolutely, yes. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the way these things take, uh, what, impetus? And then what do you say, momentum? Yes, so absolutely, yes. Um, uh, in the wave of the plan, I, I was, we've started to hear the, those kinds of initiatives. Oh, well, can we do this as part of like action X? And like, 
And I'm like, yes, yes, but it will be different. It will, it will be actually what we want if you make sure to contact all the other interested parties that should, like, if we're going to make this, right, let's just take the long, what is it? What's the biblical thing? The, the, yeah, what, what, what's the not high road there? The, the narrow, <laughs> the narrow winding, um, yeah, the, the, that thing, that thing, you know. Um, so, yes, yes. So I'd say absolutely, but they will be, they will be, they will be, uh, what do you say, amazing. They, they will look like change if they are not just the person who was doing it before is now going to do it officially, but the person who was doing it before has brought all these people together and they're going to work out something that's like really, truly, like, what? What's the word in the roadmap? State change. Thank you, Isabella. So governance, governance, I'm sharing afraid, infrastructure, I'm and reshaping ecosystems. Yana Piano. Piano Piano. Piano Piano. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Thank you. Much. And the other thing, um, Isabella, even the language and the communication, trying to communicate in this forum is extremely challenging as well. Yeah. Capis, yeah. I'd like I'd love you to just get up here and speak on your own mother tongue and just tell everybody what you wanted to say from your heart, and see if they can make sense of anything. <laughs> Capis, no, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be persistent and we have to be sensitive and we need to be respectful. And uh, it often amazes me. Everyone that talks, you, you're quietly inviting people to become part of your partnership. Why don't you scream it out loud and just get this shit going, just sort it out. And the other thing that's interesting is um, you're st still operating in little silos as well um, and you've got to come together on one page and the whole story about resourcing. This is important stuff for this nation and we need to actually perhaps come together beyond the silos and start to lobby together and advocate for increased resources because that obviously is something that you all need. Yeah? Otis, can you come up here for a sec? Don't be shy. We're going to little lunch. I told you to chill out yesterday. Now, what's your mother's name? Judith. 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 Yeah. yeah? So she's Aboriginal, eh? Yeah. Hmm. What's she been up to? Ah, uh, she's been she paints a lot. She um she's been on holiday actually. Yeah, yeah. she's good. Yeah, yeah. So how did I find that out? Information. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Yeah, you know the Murray Great one. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of conversation goes on outside as well as inside. Mm. Are these people old people making sense to you? Uh, yeah. Be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Because I ask this question, this is a legitimate question, because you're young, new in this space, and this is important. You're the future of this conversation. Yeah, I think it's been surprising how um, how much new information there was, even though I've yeah sort of been in this space for about a year, but just at a much um, lower level. So, yeah, a lot of it's new, but um, even when I don't understand something, people are... Yeah, it's never like a condescending thing. People are always really happy to um, answer any dumb questions. Mm. When <laughs> What's that again? You haven't heard mine. <laughs> <laughs> you got to, you got to get used to them old people heckling from the <laughs> sidelines. <laughs> quite a, but in a, in a cultural context, it's um, and this is important for this story. That and I said at the start, we're evolving. You're continuing to evolve and. As a young man, you don't become a man in a day. It takes a lifetime to become a man. And this whole data story is the same. It's, it's slowly but surely evolving. And when it gets to a point 20 years down the track, all of what Isabella talked about will be real. <laughs> and you'll be the one managing that. Make sense? Mm. Yeah. So you ready for a little lunch? Yeah. Okay. So we'll kick back in for our next presentation. Now, both... Liam and William, or not Liam, Liam and Paul, you haven't, 
properly met yet, but I'm going to, even though you're seeing Liam sprinting across with the microphone. Um, and Liam Jensen, I'm going to introduce you in your professional capacity first, but then I'll give him, you know, the background. So Liam is a Wiradjuri man and grew up in north, the north of Brisbane, and his mother's sitting here watching him like a hawk. He's a background in data analytics and spatial data. He's currently contributing to the Indigenous Data Network and Language Data Commons of Australia in his capacity as project officer as part of the ARDC Indigenous Internship. Now that's his professional status, but to me, he's LIM. Yeah? And interestingly, Paul, will I am, yes. <laughs> Paul is a, a Gamilaroi man from Tamworth. Paul studied languages and linguistics at the University of Queensland and has been teaching at the university and working on research and publication projects since 2020. All right. Marin Naran, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge all Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people here today including those with the responsibility to care for and speak on behalf of the country of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung peoples. My name is Liam Jensen, or LIM, known to others. I'm a Wurundjeri man who grew up north of Brisbane until recently when I moved to Melbourne to hopefully further my career. My background is in data analytics and I am a part of the ARDC Indigenous Internship Program. Internship program aims to promote Indigenous-led research infrastructure development and uplift digital skills for young Indigenous people interested in working in the research infrastructure sector. It is an important part of the humanities, arts and social sciences and Indigenous research data commons, which enables researchers to harness research data to help Australia understand and preserve our culture, history and heritage. I've been lucky enough to be assigned to the Indigenous Data Network here at the University of Melbourne to learn from amazing people such as distinguished Professor Marcia Langton, Dr. Kristen Smith and Levi Murray. I thought I'd highlight some of my most memorable experiences in my internship so far. One being my first trip out outside Australia was to New Zealand for a work event where unfortunately I spent most of it isolated in a hotel due to me picking up COVID on the plane over. <laughs> I did get one day beforehand though to look around Wellington, was very grateful to some of the really kind people there who went out of their way to make sure I was okay. Uh, another being my first time staying out in a remote Aboriginal community as you just saw in northeast Arnhem Land at Yurikala, spending time working there with the LPC. Everyone there was very friendly and generous, it was certainly interesting to fly out on a small plane also with Kristen to Millingimby. Uh, such an incredible environment out there with the most stunning waterways, waterways that you don't go to don't dare go too close to in case you end up as in a, in a croc's belly. <laughs> One of my favourite experiences was attending the Australian Indigenous Datathon at Anne's Cook University up in Cairns. The Datathon was coincidentally the only all Indigenous event I've attended in my time as an intern. It tackles challenges that people living in regional and remote communities face by bringing together Indigenous knowledge and cutting edge technology. Um, I was in one of nine competing teams there, consisting of traditional owners as well as software programmers and mentors with pro in project management. The team worked on finding solutions for pressing issue issues such as coastal erosion, indigenous health, protection of rock art, animal management, fauna identification, and for my team, emergency management. We ended up coming a close second in that competition. Uh, when I was offered this opportunity, I jumped at the chance to be part of an exciting project that would build on my current experience in data analysis and provide me the opportunity to be part of the Aboriginal-centred project that can improve the lives and well-being of Aboriginal communities. My goals for the future absolutely include giving back and helping Aboriginal communities throughout Australia. I look forward to learning more from Aboriginal knowledge holders how Indigenous data can be respectfully and culturally protected. I plan to utilise any new skills I learned throughout this internship to always benefit my people. I hope to learn from different Indigenous communities around the world also regarding the collection of Indigenous data. I also look forward to discovering innovative solutions that have a focus on building confidence and trust within Aboriginal communities. I'd like to thank Jenny and the team at the Hassanai RDC for giving me this amazing opportunity to work with such a stellar group. Furthermore, I'd like to give a special mention to Dr Tom Honeyman, whom I regularly met up with and learned much from. As my term comes to an end in August, I'm looking forward to what new opportunities are out there in this exciting and growing sector. Thank you.
Now I believe I'll hand over to Paul Williams, otherwise will I am. G'day, how's it going? Um, will I am, apparently. <laughs> I kind of, yeah, I don't mind my new nickname. Um, but yeah, I'm here to, well, I think my slides should maybe jump up at some point. But um, yeah, I'm just here to have a yarn about um, my work on the Nils Holmer Field Notes collection that I worked on mostly last year um, with Gary Tudor Smith, um, who's a Burrida, Yuman, and Garang Garang linguist, uh, previously at the University of Queensland, and also Thomas Watson, who is a Gungaloo language researcher um, here at um, Uni of Melbourne, um, and also Sophie Lewenkamp, who was previously here at Uni of Melbourne as well. Um, so yeah, just want to have a bit of a yarn about the work that we did uh, last year. Oh, here's my ticker. Yeah. So um, Nils Homer was a Swedish linguist uh, who conducted fieldwork on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages, uh, mainly in Queensland and NSW. Um, he published some notes on Queensland languages and the linguistic survey of southeastern Queensland um, back in the 1980s. Um, so the handwritten field notes which informed Holmer's published works were found in Sweden um, back in 2021, and they were sent over here to Thomas Watson at the Uni of Melbourne. Uh, the field notes consist of 26 uh, notebooks with over 2,000 pages of Indigenous language material, uh, and there are about 30 languages represented uh, there in the notebooks. Uh, the notebooks contain word lists, phrases, uh, short sentences, and some stories and songs um, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. Um, and here you can see um, some typical pages from the notebooks. Um, these ones are from a notebook called Warrigo Vertigan 5, uh, which has languages from Central and South Eastern Queensland. Uh, this page here is from um, the Southern Notebook, which has a lot of Gamilaroi and Yuwaroi languages in NSW. Um, so this is a typical layout of the notebooks with the word or phrase on the left, uh, followed by the English translation, and then the informant's initials on the right in brackets. Um, so to find out the speaker's initials, we actually um, referred to the informants listed in the published materials. So in the screenshot on the right, uh, we have a list of the Yuwalaroi and Gamilaroi uh, informants that Homer collected information from. Um, and then he also notes uh, some of the information on where he recorded them and some of the genealogical uh, information as well. Uh, the notebooks were uploaded to the Nyingan workspace and this is where we did our transcription and annotation work. So this is what the Nyingan workspace looks like here. Um, on the left we have an original page from the notebook titled Northern 3 um, and on the right we have the window that we transcribe and work in. Um, and I quite like that layout um, of having the scanned documents sit there next to the window that we work in, work in. And then if you click the preview window at the top you'll see something like this. So uh, the bits that are highlighted yellow, uh, that's extra text that we've uh, added in that isn't part of the original document. So in the notebooks, Homer usually only gave the initials of the informants, um, and so we've added in the speaker's full names there um, next to the initials. So I know LM refers to Lucy Mitchell here, so I've added her name at the top. Um, and also where Homer had abbreviated things, we would spell them out fully. Um, here, so if we knew what they meant. So Lucy Mitchell is a Gumilaroi speaker, but she also gave some Gungri words as well. Um, so Homer would abbreviate Gungri to G-U G often, so we'd spell that out fully uh, for clarity for anyone who's um, reading the notebooks. Um, so this is what the Lingan workspace looks like. Um, oh, that's repeating, don't worry. So, um, Here's a bit of Homer's orthography. Homer had his own orthography which he used. It differed a lot from some of the more modern orthographies and from IPA. Uh, so we tried to keep track of this as well um, in tables like this one here. Um, 
it didn't help that Homer sometimes strayed away from his own spelling conventions that he that he set out. So we were pretty confused a lot of the time because yeah, just three different symbols represent the same sound gets a bit confusing. Um, Homer did phonetic transcription as well. Um, I don't know if anyone's had to deal with phonetic transcription. It's pretty annoying to deal with. Um, so he's used a lot of diacritics um, on or next to or underneath consonants and vowels. And sometimes he would stack multiple diacritics on the same letter as well, which made it a bit tedious to transcribe. Um, since we were transcribing everything exactly as it was written down in the notebooks. Um, and because Homer did phonetic transcription, uh, the same word in the same language was transcribed slightly differently based on how he heard it. And that also made things a little bit confusing. Um, while we were working on the notebooks, uh, we were keeping our own metadata um, in Excel spreadsheets. Um, we noted the names and initials of the informants, the languages they spoke, uh, what notebooks they appeared in, um, and which of the published materials they were mentioned in, um, and any other relevant information as well. So some of the informants whose initials appeared in the notebooks were not named in Holmer's published materials, uh, and sometimes their language groups um, were often not recorded as well, um, but we were able to figure some of those out. Um, others are still marked as unknown. So you can see there there's probably about 10 that we're not super sure about who they are, who they are or what their languages were. Um, so here's a list of the languages in the notebooks with the Auslang codes next to it. Um, we've been linking up MOB to the notebooks that their languages appear in, but there hasn't been um, much of a process to that. It's mainly just been through uh, word of mouth and through our networks. Um, but Gary did a couple of trips out on country last year to let Mob know um, what was in the notebooks and um, who, who was in them. And I think me and Robert will do something similar um, soon. We go out on the country and try and repatriate, rematri rematriate um, materials and link up Mob to them. Um, but if your language is here, or if you know anybody whose language is here, reach out and we can link you up um, to the materials if you want to have a look, or yeah, if it's beneficial. Yeah, sweet, thank you. people have got questions. So any questions to Liam or William? Thank you very much for your presentations. They're all fascinating. Um, this is a question to both of you, which you may not be able to answer, but I was going to try anyway. To what extent do you think it's useful to try and draw a distinction between what would be generally regarded as research skills and what we might regard as specifically research infrastructure skills? I mean, were you aware of that distinction in the work that you've been doing? Oh, I you're not making this easy, are you? <laughs> um, Paul, do you have anything to comment on that? No, it's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I don't know if I'm in a position to comment on something like that. Um, it's a great question. I'm just not sure I, I am able to answer something like that. Sorry. <laughs> So just uh, because Liam's in, in our team and um, I've, you know, uh, had a lot of conversations with him, maybe a way to bridge that question would be, um, I'm, I'm guessing that both of you guys had, you know, uh, previous data analytics um, experience. Um, so perhaps um, you could answer how your previous experiences kind of led to 
um, the work that you're doing now and what some of those differences maybe were in the way that you know you, you learned how to do this when you were learning those skills out in industry or outside of academia and how that translates to actual research work that you're doing. Is that kind of related to what you were asking? Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, I fully understand that. Thank you, Trent. Uh, <laughs> so in terms of the differences between, I, I was working in the data analytics field in the corporate world, uh, and then I did that about a year, um, also training and working within that field, uh, which led on to working here at the University of Melbourne on the ARDC inter internship program. program. Uh, and it's, there is quite a few differences there. Uh, namely, uh, when I was working corporately, you're very, it's very structured. Uh, you're, it's the same thing day in, day out. Uh, specifically, I was working on a government project. Um, the, the work there was uh, quite monotonous and I didn't feel much reward in terms of giving back to Aboriginal community, which was a key part of why I ended up here. Um, so when I first heard about the Digital Starter Network, I put my hand up and spoke with Kristen and Levi and Trent, um, who were gracious enough to get in contact with the ARDC and I was put forward uh, replacing um, the brilliant lady, Lisa Rigney, uh, in terms of the ARDC inter Indigenous Internship Project. Um, yeah, that's all I had to say there. <laughs> what, um, <coughs> What did you observe, cherish, value from the year Carla visit? A lot. Uh, <laughs> it was a big change for me. I, um, furthest I've been remote was um, I went through uh, Darwin and that was about as far as I went. So got heading out to the to community, they were also welcoming. Um, and especially, you know, not everyone has the chance to head out there. That you have to be, uh, you know, invited onto uh, their, their country, uh, which made it feel like truly you're a visitor. Um, you know, not that I ever say that I take, you know, this is, you know, this is Australia is my land or anything like that. Um, <laughs> it it made you respect the country that you're on and make sure you care for it. Um, which is one key part that I specifically enjoyed and liked. That's important. I remember similar when I was your age, mm -hmm. not as good looking as you, but I was still the same age, but uh, I went to a place called What Air. Yeah. And uh, I still have that image stuck in my mind, so that's why I asked that question. Mm -hmm. You never forget those things. Mm. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. My question to Will Owens. Okay. Um, <laughs> when you were rematriating the notebooks or just in whatever contact with communities, did you come across people, because it's only, what, 45 years or something, who remembered Mills Homer? Is any? Uh, no, actually, we, yeah, we haven't. But people definitely, yeah, that, that said, this is my grandmother, this is my grandfather. Like, I definitely had a lot of uh, lineages there and we're very proud to, um, yeah, see their family um, and, the, and the language that their family said. And um, a lot of the time, too, in Nils Holmer's published materials, he's got the word list and the grammar there, but he doesn't actually attribute it to specific speakers. But in the notebooks, he does. So you're actually able to see what um, your family said, whereas you couldn't in the published materials. So that's something else that's, yeah, a good, yeah, good, for, good to have the notebooks for. Better not be a question for me. <laughs> Liam. <laughs> um, will I am. Um, the, uh, is that all the languages? Is that the exhaustive list of languages that are included? I just know I've worked with the Kayumbo people, Yugambel, and, you know, up there in North New South Wales, and it just seems you're all around there, but not you don't include them in the list. That isn't the exhaustive list. We didn't actually end up finishing transcribing and annotating all of the um, notebooks. That's the ones yeah. that we've um, found so far. That's probably most of them. Uh, there probably is some Yugambeh. There's definitely there's definitely Bunjalung in 
um, mm. in the notebooks, but probably you can bear as well. Yeah, but it's just not named you can bear in the in the notebooks I've seen. None of the bull sounding. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. Mm. Robert, I just sort of might add in if it's helpful with that Homer material. There's there's probably a little bit more to it in that there's the notebooks. That's you know that's the sort of stuff that wasn't you know readily available that they're bringing light to now, and that incredible work will continue post July um, with further uh, you know uh, metadata enrichment practices with communities, and and perhaps we'll find some more speakers. But to your question, that there were some there were recordings prior to that before these notebooks. So there's another collection again from him, and I was just going to share a, a quick example. I was sitting up in Jinjin, which is um, just uh, uh, probably 40 minutes up from Bundaberg, very, uh, in terms of Queensland history, one of the first places of having contact, perhaps, if not the f um, one of the first, if not the first, to, to endure massacres in that area. Um, I was sitting with an old lady, um, Annie Marina, and I share this story in another presentation where I, she said, oh, my mother would sing this song. I said, what's that song? And so I said, can you remember that song? She'd sing it back and for what she remembered. And um, we sat down in that kitchen 60 years later and played that tape back of her mother. And Homer had sat in that very same spot in that kitchen and that recording of her mother singing that song. And so that was one of those special moments, just in terms of linking it back. So I, I really hope we have some more of those experiences when we go out and do the enrichment with the um, field notes. So my question's for William. Um, when we get oh. our fingers into these... Uh, <laughs> I like when you nickname, but it's, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Will, I, will I am? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, there we go. Uh, when we stick our fingers in these uh, historical records, um, it, it really helps us to see, uh, you know, things that we probably wouldn't do ourselves going forward. It's a chance to see that when you're in the thick of uh, managing these, uh, collecting of information and, and laying it down, that it's easy to make mistakes. Do you feel that it's also given you a chance to think about your own practice and what you might do if you were in a similar position or uh, things that you might bring to future work for yourself as well? It's a good question. Let me think about that one. <laughs> okay. um. I'll tell you what. While you're thinking about it, maybe I could throw back to Simon and ask him what he thinks the difference between research and in research infrastructure is. <laughs> I walked into that one, didn't I? <laughs> um, I think there is a very high overlap but I think there are some areas that we can distinguish. So when Will I Am was describing what he's been working on, I was thinking, uh, this to me, a lot of this is research. This is what I would expect a researcher to do, to work carefully with sources. But there is, there were some uh, little other bits. So although we would nowadays expect researchers to be scrupulous about metadata with the material they're working with, there was a sense here that that was maybe a little bit more important here. Um, so I think that that's the kind of areas where I see boundaries, or not, not hard boundaries, fuzzy boundaries, more concern about not using data for immediate purposes but also having in mind, not just using data for immediate purposes, but also having in mind the long-term value of the material that you're working for and doing what you need to do to make sure that that will be available to people in the future. Yeah, but maybe that's, maybe that's still not a real distinction because maybe we should be saying in the current 
at climate in the way we should be working today, that should be an ethical responsibility on all researchers. <laughs> but I think there can be differences of emphasis, at least. So I'm going to ask, um, we're going to progress into the next the session, but it's going to be a continuation of the conversation. And I'm going to ask, will I am and how I am to take a seat because you're not off the hook yet. <coughs> and I know that you're about trying to sneak off into the, but this is your day, this is your time. Just enjoy the journey. And look, as I said, you know, when you speak from the heart about what you know, you'll always be fluent and you just enjoy this opportunity to have questions asked and support, you know, and that sort of stuff. I'm going to answer that question that was put back to you, Tom, by, and Chris, and you don't need to worry about the translation of that video. I'm glad it was shown in that way because that's reality. That's reality. And you could see the, the issues there. But I'm going to translate it for you and it's going to answer that question and the importance of this stuff, yeah? That video talked about gathering information in a way you all knew, are comfortable with. Did you get that message? That was in the translation. Precious stuff, important stuff, from old people, long gone. Did you get that? Treasuring information, passing on to the next generation, which is what you were just talking about, Simon. Where will it take us into the future? That was it. You don't need a translation. But you need to see their reality. And their reality is different to your reality. And that's where, you know, 40 years ago, people talked about urban, rural, remote. When you go into places like that, you start to see a distinct difference, a disparity in terms of resources and people's capability. And yesterday we were talking about black mould and I'm still stuck in the, why is everything bad black? <laughs> there must be, there's got to be a scientific name for that. Um, and then Mike got into a conversation about the best thing is, the best thing about black is when it's in your bank account. But then the sad reality is most of those communities, they're always in the red, which is interesting. So this next conversation is opening it up to, so there's no need for a translation. It was very clear. We just got to see through it. And Liam, you said giving, giving back. You'll always be giving back. That's part of what we do. But take away the word hope. You'll continue to learn. Same as you, Will. I've gone from Will I am to William to Will. <laughs> so we're going to open it up for a conversation about investing in people, sorry, investing in people for research data commons. commons. And it's just open on open conversation. And Kit's, in her 74 <coughs> versions of the agenda, has given me a little <laughs> a series of questions to ask. But I'm going to read it to you. In this session, in the room, I want to consider ways that Hass and Indigenous RDC can build up people as it supports the ARDC purpose to provide Australian researchers with competitive advantage through data. And the discussion should be exploratory and cover wide ground and with a large number of voices represented. So that's putting it out there. This is open conversation. So, how do, how do, uh, so the discussion should follow. I'm just reading this verbatim. Where attendees want to take the topic, some ideas we can tease out. How, do you, how to define the skills and positions needed to create the AR, 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 create the RDC. So we'll list one by one. I'm going to put it out there. Yeah. How to define the skills and positions needed to create the RDC. That's the question. And don't look at me with blank looks. This is your jam, not my jam. So what skills you need? And positions. Sandra. Some Native Canadian work yeah. um, led by First Nations women in Canada. Um, and one element of the suite of services, programs, packages they offered 
was something that was referred to as humility training. Um, so in terms of skills and positions, which is a little bit different to how we're framing it, people, um, a skillful white fellas could be humility training. Um, because we've just listened to two amazing young, sorry, younger than a met most of us here, um, people who are staunchly black. And we didn't pause to go, what the, you know, what part, what hard work preceded, let alone the parenting work <laughs> perspective, <laughs> preceded this moment. So humility training on the one hand, and I would challenge every person in this room, every white person in this room, to commit to going back to their respective workplaces and say, I'm going to ensure a position, several positions, several pathways, for Indigenous peoples. We don't land here by accident. You know, it's really, really hard work for us to be who we are. I think we've got probably four generations of Indigenous people in this forum. If we go start with Liam, I think you and Otis are probably the youngest. <laughs> um, and, you know, at the other end we've got me and then... Uncle Michael, Michael, Grant, you before Michael. But yeah, we're, we're possibly looking at four generations of Indigenous peoples and we've got, you know, so much experience in this space. But we, we need non-Indigenous people to go into their own workplaces and have the arguments every day. This doesn't happen by accident. And you are all responsible for making the change. And not only when you you know, ensure the great success of recruiting mob, how do you actually work with mob? Bring in the humility training again, perhaps. Anyway, I'll stop talking. But this is real. It's what you no, said on Monday. It's real, real yep. talk. Yep. You know, we can talk about capacity building until the cows literally come home. But if you're not actually out there creating opportunities, ensuring retention of Indigenous expertise, helping to build it with us, helping to make change, you're going to just keep returning every year and having the same conversations. Let me summarise that in a quote. <clears throat> if you find yourself on a committee or in a workplace discussing the needs of a particular group of people but you look around the room and don't see anyone from that group, you should be highly sceptical of any conclusions reached. Grand Sarah. No. <laughs> but no, that's it. And I, I use the analogy in the past where you're all in the construction industry, you're building, you don't have the electricians telling the plumbers what to do. So that's, you know, you've got to build some cohesion. Ken. You tried to get me to talk at every one of these things in today's yes. day. Yeah. Um, Introducing. So I want to come at this from the perspective of someone who's, uh, first of all, thank you very much for those points, Sandra. It was a fantastic point. Um, from the perspective of someone who um, <clears throat> has, you know, background in sociology, but also kind of more of the, uh, I guess, data-oriented work, um, and someone who has been involved in, you know, the teaching of, um, you know, data analysis, stats, that sort of thing. Um, when I first came to the University of Melbourne about five years ago, um, I made some contact with people um, in the sociology department here and some other departments as well. I was over in the Faculty of Arts. And uh, it blew my mind when I found out that there was actually no, uh, like, a introduction to data uh, or stats or any kind of research method sequence, uh, even at the graduate level. And that was just absolutely mind-blowing to me because I, I remember having these conversations with people and saying, well, 
how can you expect a graduate student to at some point, you know, go into academia or industry and then, you know, understand how data actually works. And, and that includes the entire cycle of, you know, what we mean when we say data, so not just analytics part. Um, and then with, you know, the ARDC position, the intern position where we, um, we were lucky enough to get Liam, uh, I remember having conversations with him and saying, listen, you know, I, like I want you to learn this stuff, right? Because this is gonna come in handy for you, not just here, but after you're done here. And we looked all over and we couldn't find anything at the university except for those like two day workshops on how to use Python to do text analysis. Um, first of all, a two day workshop does not teach you anything, right? Um, it just exposes you to what's out there. And in my experience, people who don't have that background will go into these workshops and within 20 minutes they're like, this is, I, I just don't wanna do this because I have to go through, this is, this, you know, there's a learning curve involved and all that. And the only solution that we had was for, to, to enroll Liam in a data camp, uh, like a, what was it, 10 week or 10 step course or something yeah. like that? Online course. Yeah. Online course where, you know, um, they kind of teach you the basics of how to do some stuff, right? In terms of like data analysis, but that's not enough. Um, uh, data camp, it's just a website, it's like a business model. But uh, to, to go back to your point uh, from the perspective of someone who's non-indigenous, um, I know that myself and there are a lot of people um, around us who are very interested in build, you know, upskilling in, you know, indigenous students, undergrads, interns, graduate students, but it's very difficult um, because there is just no support for that at the university level. And I've had conversations with people um, where I've proposed that, hey, there should be some kind of sequence for, you know, like past researchers, um, maybe like a 16-week course, just a basic introductory course. This is something that can be done. It's not very difficult. It's not very time intensive. There are people on this campus, many people on this campus who are interested and have the knowledge, but I don't know where that gap comes from. There's just no, there doesn't seem to be an interest in implementing something like that. So um, anyway, that's just... Maybe a little cynical, but. Uh, well, as Associate Dean Indigenous in the Faculty of Arts, we can continue this conversation about <laughs> what's required. Um, and where does it come from? The Western episteme that has disembodied all sources of knowledge and pathways to knowledge. And that's what we're working against. Yeah. And we, talk, we often talk about the notion of cultural lens, putting the cultural lens into play. We need to actually reflect back and look at the Western lens that has created the situation where we're at. And we need to, you know, we're talking, listening to that conversation. Even in these conversations where you have someone like me that's a rat bag that facilitates, I'm very mindful of the important role and responsibility I have to play in the presence of these young men. I don't need to be gammon or yanayish or carry on cue, but I need to have a sense of honour and integrity and dignity and humility because this is what needs to be passed on. That's part of a kinship-led approach, yeah? But the humility is forever present, yeah? But the passion and the heartfelt commitment to see the future, because it's not here, it's there. Western world don't have that. This handsome fox right there. Thanks. Um, you know, because we're talking about research infrastructure here and Paul showed us using Ningan. So Ningan is a piece of infrastructure and I think when, when infrastructure is good, it sort of becomes invisible. You're able to use it, um, it's fairly intuitive to use. And so there's a, just such a fantastic example of this gang of Paul and Gary and Thomas, Tom, using Ningan to engage with language. Now Ningan is meant to be hosted by IATSIS. And I want to just raise the issue of IATSIS here because we saw that wonderful work done at Yirrkala, not done by IATSIS. Uh, Ningan, not done by IATSIS. So and in this room, anybody from IATSIS? So this is the major $20 million a year Indigenous run, right? There's an Indigenous council which is meant to be doing this stuff and it's not. So what's gone wrong? You know, they should have been out there working with Yirrkala, with all of the other agencies that have this material that's at risk. And, and yet it's down to an ad hoc funding thing that, you know, the wonderful relationship that's been developed with Melbourne Uni and Yirrkala, but there are many other places that don't have that relationship. So there's a real problem, I think. Mm -hmm. 
um, that I'd like at some point somebody to address. <laughs> well, it's, it, it, I'm picking up there's, uh, there's this concept that we relate to in terms of trauma specific around lateral violence and the capacity that black followers, we're the best at pulling each other down. You often hear that, yeah? IATSIS and others. Does it, is there an organisational notion of protecting and nurturing and sustaining, but actually holding each other back? I don't know. We have to stay, yeah, gatekeepers, all that sort of stuff, but that's all byproduct. But we've got to get to a point where we share, and that's what uh, Isabella talked about, sharing infrastructure, sharing knowledge. Um, because this is all important. It's not about I, me, my. This is my information. Well, no, that's we. We're here together to work through this. Anyway, I'm not going to... Any other comments in relation to that question? Do you have any... Penny? Um, just thinking about building capacity and investing in people, and it's fantastic. Thank you both. That was really wonderful. But I'm just curious as to how much encouragement you received in the higher education and like secondary schooling to move into spaces like this. Because I think we need to go deeper even and the education departments and, and universities speaking to each other about you can't be what you can't see going to regional areas and beyond the cities and urban areas and showing young Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander kids young adults, what they can do. So I think there also needs to be push across that wider, um, younger sector in higher, in you know, secondary school, for example. As we progress to the next question, I think, Otis, are you going to ask a question? Then we're going to go to Maggie. But I just want to share these other points just to generate more thoughts. Ways to improve researcher skills to access new infrastructure being created. How to find and support people in new positions being created across the RDC in the next four years, potential for mentorships, and the role of kinship-led approaches. So, yep, Otis. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring it back to, in terms of investing in people and, yeah, building up the skill sets. It's great to have people on the team, but I just wanted to bring reference to sort of working with Aldaka um, a big part of, I guess the most meaningful part of it has been the, obviously shout out to the whole team, but um, with Ben Foley on the team, he's really been able to support me in that way in terms of bringing the skills that are being learnt back to sort of why I want to be in this space in the first place. So whether that looks like actually working with community data and ensuring that so I think I just wanted to shout that out in terms of when there are young Indigenous people joining your teams, having a chat with them about why they actually want to be in these spaces and what they want to achieve, what they want to learn. And yeah, trying to keep the focus around that um, just for anyone who's in those positions. And Otis, you can come out and join me at the front with these two <laughs> handsome gentlemen. <laughs> Poor Otis. <laughs> and Bridie. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a seat for you. I'm noticing a common theme. <laughs> I'm looking at age and I'm looking at future generations. I'm looking at kinship nurturing and investing in people, youth and youth. Yeah. I've been sticking to my bloke for a long time here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the future. This is the generations that we've got to invest in. So we transfer knowledge to this generation, but we transfer honour, integrity, dignity, humility. That's important stuff. That's cultural business. That's in all different people's culture, whether it be Italiana, whether it be Asian community culture, that's what culture is. In this Western world, in an Australian psyche, we just lost the plot and we need to heal in this country and start to look at kinship ways of doing, knowing and doing. Maggie. And any of you young, you can direct your questions to any of these young people here. Because I'm old and over this shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to say what a fantastic um, conversation. I've just been so, I'm so grateful to be here to be able to listen to it. So thanks everybody. Um, 
back to those original questions, Grant, that you asked and following on from what you had said, I think it's Kent. I, I, so I'm Maggie Nolan, I'm the Director of Austin at the University of Queensland. And I, I work in literary studies and it's very common for people in literary studies to, to even hear the word data and start to kind of go, data? Or, you know, or what's data got to do with me? And I think um, almost prior to the skills, you at, one of the things that I think we could be doing is showing people who would turn off to data that there are questions that cannot be answered without it. And that so to kind of have a curiosity driven sense of wonder about it, which I've got to say is something I have developed in my role at, at Aussie. It's, it's blown me away, it's capacity. There's stuff you just cannot do if you're just used to reading a handful of books and saying I know about literature, you know. So um, I think somehow getting a sense of um, it's not dry, it's not, um, uh, it's not objective, it's kind of totally embedded in, in, in curiosity, in culture, in um, unpredictability and uncertainty and it, you never know where it's going to go. And so somehow get that, because I think that can excite people about what's possible. But I know in, often in the humanities, it's, um, that's got nothing to do with me. I don't, I'm not interested in that. And so somehow bridging that gap to, to then say, well, if you're, if you're really curious about this, these are the skills you'll need to develop and then kind of have it be question driven rather than workshop, skills workshop driven. Yeah, no, where's the question coming from? I don't know. Nola. Oh, you, Can I just, while I'm walking here, give a plug? On the 31st of July, we're going to do a workshop for summer school. What are we going to do? What are we going to say to the HDRs, the ECRs in that summer school? And I'm after everybody to throw topics around. So please turn up for continuing. More information later. You haven't got Italian ancestry yet, by the way. A couple of days, you know. Let's put the hands around. We'll speak with the leg. We got this. Um, my name's Nola Turner Jensen. I'm Wiradjuri. I'm here on a fellowship here at the Science Faculty um, a Diversity Inclusion Indigenous Fellowship for two years. Um, one of the things I would like to say to these beautiful young people out there is that in our culture, in our system, because we have a system that's very ancient but still relevant and working and sustained, um, is that um, knowledge holders um, are the future. So when we look at our elders, um, they usually filter the knowledge down. And so we work from that end back because an elder is someone that's been through all the law, uh, the three levels uh, or, or whatever, mostly three, um, have learnt all the knowledge. And so as you move up our framework, which is very structured, um, you actually have a different name and a different level and you are responsible for different things and you have different relationships with people. But the elders, um, they, they earn a name that means without, without. Now to English, without, without means, man, you've really got nothing. <laughs> but in Aboriginal terminology and translation, in law, it actually means you're without needing anything more. You are full of knowledge. So these are the elders who filter this down and they're responsible for it in our world. You talk about youth because in the Australian context, in the Australian system, youth is the future. Youth are the ones to, that we admire and we think have got the energy and they've got the, you know, the they're innovative and all this. And uh, for us, in our system, we go, they don't know anything. They, they, they got 
they got so much to learn uh, and we, we can't even assume they'd be a leader. So this, uh, without, without, <laughs> um, is what we aim for in our, in our beautiful system. And so I would encourage that what we should be doing, if you want data into the schools and to the young people, do the opposite in our world and actually train up our old people in data and they will filter down and, uh, and take back what they have lost in their roles. You know, I have elders, they ring me, I have one on the weekend, a woman, because women's role in particularly the East Coast of Australia has been diluted down to, the, to being not what it used to be, the powerful presence it used to be in most places. And I was talking her to her and she said, I feel so ashamed. I am seen as an elder in this community but I don't know anything that you're talking about, Nola. I don't know. And this is the position they're in, to feel shame because they have to pretend they're knowledgeable because in our space, they're meant to be. So that's what I want to say. As I said to Liam, you, <laughs> you don't become a man or a woman in a day and you just it's a journey uh, and that's all part of that cultural framework. The other thing that's important in the data space is how do we make this young woman feel safe and valued and respected for her being her? Mm -hmm. And that's where we talk about the values that we talk about. Women are sacred, not misogynistically sacred, but culturally sacred. That's the language we've got to speak. Yet in a Western world, we talk about 70 plus women that die because of domestic violence, because we as Australian society are still trying to learn how to behave with dignity and respect toward women. Culturally, that's law. You know what you must do. So how do you keep safe? How do we mentor young people in this space? What, what are some of the things that you need? What, what would you like to see in terms of mentorship, Friday? Uh, big question there, Friday. Well, you've got a bro there to talk to as well, and that's always important. You've got to have people that you can rely on to support each other. Don't be a shy. How's that for reflex? Hey. <laughs> Sometime today would be lovely. No, you just relax. I guess um, one thing I'm thinking of is maybe in terms of what Sandra was saying, um, create, having roles and creating roles for Indigenous people, maybe young people or people learning in this context as well, um, that are not only there for the sake of it, but that they are tailored to um, You know, and honour, I guess, the skills that people have been learning and training for and can continue that instead of, um, maybe not instead of, but, like, yeah, having those roles connect to the pathways that people are already on, um, not just be there for the sake of it and be there as, yeah, roles that are, within data spaces or within institutions that maybe they're already working out, but um, that connect to what they're doing, not be disconnected, I suppose, even though they're ostensibly in the same space and in the same world. I think that would be supportive. Okay. Any other questions that people have to this little group of people? Little group of people? So building off of everything we've seen today, I want to bring it to something I noticed out on Mythica country, working with the Mythica Aboriginal Corporation, which is the idea of sustainable investment in people. Because we've talked about youth learning, we've talked about humility, we've 
talked about making these pathways. And one of the things that was very apparent to me out on Mythic Country is how much cultural load is being put on the rangers. Because they were young Aboriginal uh, working very hard and they've had to become ad hoc polymaths in order to protect and work with their cultural material. They've had to become hold on, so geologists, biologists, anthropologists, historians. They've had to figure out how to work with government organizations, learn their own culture, learn university, how universities function. They don't. But all the politics in between had to learn all of these things ad hoc in the past, what, five or six years? Yeah, it's definitely the, burnout. Yeah, that's the thing, is this burnout from cultural load is something we need to be thinking about when we talk about investment in youth and investment in building these opportunities is that going into these roles has a high burnout and that part of the culture of academia and in building this infrastructure is not placing all of the burden onto these specialized people, but spreading this burden of thinking about indigenous data, thinking about what these, what we need to integrate into our data and our metadata and our governance needs to be something everyone is doing, academics built into the ethics process, into the research design, because currently it's not built into the research design and then they go out and then it's the indigenous people who have to learn how biological data is used, what it can be used for in the future and how to build governance around that. And they, they're not biologists, they don't have the privilege of specialization. Specialization is a huge privilege, so I th the people who have specialized should also be taking on that burden because it's not sustainable to just have one group of people doing this work. In that uh, list of the skill sets that you, you spoke to, you, you missed the fact that they also have to just recently present a 32-page analysis on the merits of yes and no in the voice conversation just to throw that in on the side. But. We're over time, I know David, but it doesn't matter, a couple of days is only big lunch. <laughs> I just thought maybe I could give a somewhat abstract yet practical example of how this investing in people and building indigenous capabilities seems to fall um, as particularly these projects that fit within the institutions and our role, particularly my role in a project management position, um, is certainly there in the interplay between the schools, faculty, the funding co-partners or investors, um, and how that sort of rolls out in terms of investing in people, particularly young blackfellas. One of the challenges that I have faced um, in terms of growing capacity, growing the project and balancing those interests is retaining Indigenous staff um, within the schools or the faculties. Um, in that, when it's convenient, as you know, we've talked explicitly about this, we like to use uh, young black fellas, put them in positions and all the rest of it, but the school doesn't always retain them otherwise. So we have seen, we haven't retained Indigenous staff because they haven't been retained in the school. Um, so they've been retained through our project and then there's that sort of back and forth but there's no really there's no real acknowledgement of that and there's also no real plan uh, there's no coordination with the project and the schools in terms of how do we ma retain these staff how do we develop um, indigenous capabilities in what it is that we're doing if that kind of helps without <laughs> complicating it's a challenge no no and I'm just picking up on these two young followers there, trying to worm their way onto this young panel. But <laughs> key, the key word, key word was investment. How do you invest in young people's perspective? How do you nurture that? Because they got a lot to contribute to an ageing mindset. 
and throw in beyond investment and honor and integrity, empathy. How do we have empathy and how do we value the diversity of skills? Why are we obsessed? This is a classic for me. Why are we, we obsessed with the sexuality of human beings? What does that matter what people's sexuality is? They're at work. They don't care. They don't have to talk about sex life. That's it. <laughs> Why do we waste time on that? Why don't we just get on and be human and invest in a conversation around what we're there to work for? Yeah? It doesn't matter. Just be you. Empathy. What's empathy all about? What's your empathy about? I'm going to show you a quick, very quick lesson on empathy. Look at me, look at me. Now, I'm going to point to a letter on this thing and you're going to tell everyone what that letter is. Okay? And if you get it, I'll give you $27 million because Kristen and I won the American Lotto. <laughs> All right, you ready? Empathy. How do you have it every day? Empathy is about being able to put yourself in the shoes of other human beings in order to understand how they might think, feel and behave. Yeah? You ready? I'm going to point to the letter. But now I want you to put your hands over your eyes because you're now sight impaired. And that's the letter I'm pointing to there. Can you tell everyone? Everyone else knows. Why don't you know? You catching what I'm pitching? Humanise the story. Develop the right head and the right heart. Embrace kinship leadership. Sit with people on the ground. My deadly sister from Aranda. Yeah, we know how to fix the problems in Aranda country. You don't need to go from Ngunnawal country and... Tell them what they've got to do. Just talk to the old people about the problem, the issue. Let them tell you what the story is. And let them come up with the solutions and the actions. Same in your car, right? But you've got to invest in that process. Now, you young people, that's what you've got to do. Great. I was just, I was just thinking back to yesterday uh, when you, you mentioned um, about, I think it was Portugal, yep. um, telling Poland how to do a, a uh, data commons or something, was it? Yeah. If I remember correctly. And uh, you asked the entire room here, um, for those that were here yesterday, um, what's the problem? What, 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 what's the problem with that? And there was crickets, uh, which I found a bit funny. Uh, and uh, I think the first suggestion, nothing wrong with it, whoever uh, suggested that, was distance. Mm -hmm. So then he went to, I think it was Germany, mm -hmm. and still nothing. You had to eventually um, answer yourself. I could see it, but I didn't. I, I wanted to see what was actually going to come out of it, and then it was uh, it was silence, which was very interesting. Hmm. I was just wanting to note that. I just want to note that. I use the words humanize, culturalize, environment, environmentalize, localize, and I don't even know that they're real words. <laughs> but if you just get the right head and the right heart, and and you know I've seen words in the past phrases. We'll make a concerted effort to address this socio-economic disadvantage. I'm sick of seeing that. Why are, in that First Nation space, why are the original inhabitants of these lands the most impoverished and oppressed people in their own land? Why? Why are 70 plus women a year losing their life to some form of domestic violence? Yet we in Australia have this wild vision. Oh, Palestine, there's genocide. Yes, there is genocide happening there. And I'll tell you the story about Palestine that's happening today. In 236 years from now, they will be still talking like we're talking today. Why? Because it's a human thing. We're not prepared to shift this with this together and actually do things authentically. And you know, the other phrase, reasonable adjustment. This doesn't take much to reasonably adjust the way we think and feel and behave to create a better space for the young people to progress in the future. That's the journey that you're gonna take. And I have faith personally that in the next 100 years, you're gonna do that. Yep, and that's part of the journey. I'd like to respectfully invite Patrick Wilstrom, Wils let me get, hmm? Patrick Wickstrom, where are you Patrick? 
Patrick, hello Patrick. And, and Damiano, Damiano Spina, Italiano. Si, capisci. Andiamo. Grazie mille. Thank you, Grant, uh, for inviting us. And yeah, before I start, I would like to start, uh, acknowledge um, that we are gathering in the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people. Um, I'd like to acknowledge also the place where I live, Bunwaran country, and also where Patrick lives, Yagara, and the, the lands of the Yagara Turba uh, people. And I pay my respects to their ancestors and elders, past, present, and upcoming and pay my respects to all Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today, your elders and your connection to country. So we are here today to, to talk about the uh, recently announced, as recent as Monday, uh, <laughs> the Australian Internet Observatory. And yes, yeah, so we are uh, Patrick uh, Wistrom from the uh, QUT. He's an associate investigator of the ARC Center of Excellence on Automated Decision Making and Society, ADM plus S. I'm also an associate investigator, and I'm from the School of Community Technologies at uh, RMIT, and we are both a research lead for QT and RMIT. So let's see if I find it. Okay, so uh, we might or might not like it the way it is, but uh, uh, in the last uh, decade, <coughs> uh, we, we, we should uh, acknowledge that the digital platforms and digital services were, uh, have a significant uh, impact in the way we create, generate, interact, and share information um, across uh, the world. And I would like to acknowledge that uh, the interactions and the, uh, that the those interactions that are created on country, um, they might not necessarily be uh, stored in, on country. It might be stored in, in data centers spread uh, across the world, who knows where, and, and uh, stored. And the access to the, the, those interactions uh, are not necessarily open to everybody. And uh, the, the custodians of those platforms are the really the ones that they have it. So then if we want to build the foundations that Grant uh, was mentioned before on country, we should bring some of those bricks back to be able to do that. Uh, and that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the aim of the Australian Internet Observatory. So we do know that uh, there is a potential, uh, there is a, uh, and we witness the benefits that digital platforms and digital services brings to the Australian society, but they also bring challenges that we need to be able to observe what's happening in those platforms and services to be able to address those challenges. <clears throat> uh, so when we, when we talk about social data, we talk about that broad uh, in, uh, idea of social data is, no? So it's anything that is created when we interact with those digital platforms or digital services. So let's, uh, I'm going to try to help you to in addition to the coffee that you had after lunch to get awake. Um, so how many of you have used Google today? Okay, fair amount. How many of you have used ChatGPT today? Nice. How many of you? <laughs> Is that to get the quote that you shared before? How many of you have used TikTok today? No. All right. So that's what I was expecting. Good. So I don't, I, I'm not on TikTok either. But you might, you might uh, uh, think that there are some TikTok users in Australia, right? So then if we want to understand what do they see, what is the recommender system uh, showing them, if we start, if we use the traditional uh, research 
methods that we have, like, well, let's do snowballing from our networks, we might not be able to, to address that, no? or to, to be able to connect with us, those communities. Uh, so we might need different methods to do that. So what do we want to study? So some of the research applications are those type of uh, things, no? Like if we, we want to look at the uh, public health and welfare issues. So who is, who, is, who is being targeted with gambling ads on Facebook? Um, dark ads and manipulative consumer practices. What is happening with influencers, apps and trends? Search engines, uh, uh, information access systems, including search engines, recommender system, large language model-based conversational agents. What does it mean that the user is satisfied with the information needs that they uh, have? And how is the, interact the interaction happening in those systems? Um, government service delivery, there is a broad scope of potential uh, research that can be done if we have that research infrastructure built. So that's the digital uh, research challenge, so the, that black box, no? So we, we have uh, uh, the access to commercial platforms and data that is uh, uh, there is difficult and is getting more difficult, no? Because uh, APIs are getting less and less uh, uh, available for researchers. And we, are, we need to be able to observe platforms and interactions as well as content. So observability is also essential to explainability, to explainability and accountability. If you want to make uh, digital platforms and services accountable, we need to be able to have evidence-based uh, uh, interactions and data to, to um, show what's going on there. So to do that, we need tools, new tools and methods that go beyond without uh, what social media platforms provide and ensure. Even if they uh, provide some uh, access to, like uh, uh, Meta has the uh, ads library, you know? So when you start looking at the type of data that you can access to, it's just very limited slice of the data and not the full picture of what's going on there. Um, so I, this is not only useful for, uh, and I keep uh, seeing that we, uh, everything that I've witnessed in the last three days, I keep thinking as a computer scientist, I'm saying like, well, I'm not a Haas researcher, but everything I've seen, like this thing is super useful for data scientists or information retrieval researchers, no? So we are building something that goes beyond Haas and, and uh, indigenous uh, research uh, communities. Um, so advancing knowledge of technology behind digital platforms is one of the use cases that we we are able to to work on if we have this uh, infrastructure. So the social data is is highly diverse. Um, we are talking about uh, text, uh, speech data, audio, video, images, structured data, but also metadata, and uh, interactive and ephemeral uh, data from a large. Uh, so it's not one platform on digital service that we are talking about, but there are multiple out there that are having a significant impact in the Australian society. And it's also highly dynamic. Um, so not only the, the user needs are diverse and dynamic, but also like the research context and the platforms it themselves. So it was nice to see yesterday when, uh, let me see if I remember the names, Thomas, Matt, and Herman, and Tom had a question about, or pointing out the, the way of making the, with the geospatial demonstrators and embracing change in the way of building those, uh, that infrastructure, that's the same approach that we are aiming here. So we are, un, we are aware that the way the platforms or the interactions are uh, happening in platforms are going to be changing over years and we need to be ready to adapt to that. Policy and regulatory responses is also something that we need to be aware of uh, that is going to be changing. Potential benefits uh, of better access to social data. Well, so uh, we can summarize this of being en enabling uh, advancing knowledge and, and building 
uh, doing research uh, that involves uh, social data and interactions in those platforms and services, as as improving public policy decision making across government, a better understanding of uh, one of the main threats of uh, of our society. No, so how uh, misinformation and and uh, misleading advertising and information is being shared across uh, social media and other platforms. Uh, trust and accountability, monitoring uh, platforms and services, as well as being able to systematically evaluate better solutions that are, or uh, applications that are embedded in those platforms. If we want to, and this, uh, that's what we do, no? so like uh, doing better information retrieval system, better search engines, better conversational agents, you need to have a way of creating test collections that typically involve having access to this uh, information or data that is in the platforms. Of course, there is uh, opportunities as being part of a, 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 the international community to have collaborations across uh, other communities and researchers around the globe. This is already happening. Uh, we have uh, other approaches uh, other in other places in the world, mainly in Europe, different places in Europe and in the United States, um, doing observatories to, to be able to address uh, these problems in the uh, digital challenges on um, digital platforms and digital services. So uh, one of the main uh, methods and, and infrastructure uh, components is the, the idea of uh, data donations. So because Patrick and I are the uh, research leads of QUT and RMIT, but uh, Julian and Amanda are the ones that couldn't be here, but they are here virtually. We got a video that, uh, that where you can see their faces there. Uh, so we have the video embedded in the PowerPoint, but if you do you want to do it uh, here, or is it better the YouTube link that I shared? Okay, so let's see if it works. Hi, I'm Amanda Lawrence. I'm a research fellow at the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and a program lead on the Australian Internet Observatory. The Australian Internet Observatory is national research infrastructure that will make uh, digital platform data and systems more observable and uh, analysable by researchers in Australia and around the world. There's been a really dramatic transformation in how Australians use digital tools, digital platforms, how they interact with the digital economy how they entertain themselves, how they communicate with each other over the last decade or so. But we've had very little visibility as researchers of how the new digital platforms work. We know that they create all kinds of new capabilities, they bring new benefits, but we also know that they create new kinds of risks, new kinds of harms, the Australian Internet Observatory is building on a strong foundation of digital research infrastructure to establish a national joined up ecosystem that will enable exciting research and fits really neatly into the existing Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons. Platforms often talk about transparency and accountability and these things are really important but that tends to rely on the platforms themselves dictating the terms of what that transparency might mean. What researchers want is observability where we can look at the issues that we think are important. We're very proud of the fact that it's attracted the interest and attention and commitment of collaborators both across the centre and also beyond it in terms of universities, researchers and policy makers and community organisations. So you can learn more about this project at internetobservatory.org.au
easy to remember, internetobservatory.org.au. Um, so these are our uh, collaborators and partners. So we've got RMIT, QUT, the University of Queensland, the University of Melbourne, Swinburne University, Deakin University, and of course we are uh, part of ARDC and funded by uh, invest with the investment of the National Research in Infrastructure for Australia. And we are uh, collaborators, we have collaborators, uh, well it's an in initiative of the ADMS Center of Excellence, but also, also with other Center of Excellence and observatories uh, in Europe and in the US. Um, so yes, we have is one, one more block of, uh, one more program of uh, um, has an indigenous uh, research data commons. And we believe that, of, of course, we are going to, we are already learning from, from the other programs, but I think we, the, we have a, a complementary skills and infrastructure that will help uh, to advance knowledge uh, in different areas. This is the, our team, um, and uh, I will pass over to Patrick. Thank you, Damiano. So, uh, great to see you all from up here. I hope you stay uh, awake a little bit longer. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what is inside this thing that we call the Australian Internet Observatory. And um, we have four streams um, that we call data sourcing, the data laboratory, and uh, two streams that are focused on governance, uh, and data management, and uh, community outreach and research training. So I'll talk about um, the, uh, them all in turn. So. Um, Starting with data sourcing, so uh, Damiano has already mentioned the fact that this approach uh, that we call data donation is a key component of what we do in, in the uh, Internet Observatory. And so let me explain a little bit more about what that actually means. So this is a, a definition of, of what data donation actually means, and that is that, that uh, a participant is actively consenting to donate and to, or to transfer their personal data to a specific course. So it's a question of personal data uh, that uh, they, uh, in some shape or form, transfer to a research team. And uh, there are many different shapes and forms of uh, doing this, but two uh, main approaches that we've been um, that we will be working with in the Internet Observatory. Uh, are, uh, well, what the first one is, and I will give you some examples of this, so it will be very concrete so you understand what it actually means, but uh, that we somehow uh, install a plugin, uh, a little piece of software on a participants' um, mobile phones or laptops that allow them to collect data and donate that to the research team. And the other version is based on uh, a, um, a regulatory framework uh, from the EU that is called GDPR, uh, that actually has had impact across the world uh, and uh, requires all platforms of a certain size to allow its users to download their personal data. Maybe some of you have tried that. It's, it, it's, not, it's quite technically uh, awkward to do it, but uh, you should be able to do it, or should, you can, do it from the Facebook or the, the, the X Twitter, whatever it's called these days, and so on and so forth. So I encourage you all to do that. It's actually it's uh, a bit uh, scary and terrifying and interesting to see what kind of data they they will have on you. Uh, so those are the two key uh, approaches for data donations that we work with, and um, we use the term citizen science uh, a bit. Um, respectfully, uh, but in, it is important for us to, to note that we want to invite participants to, uh, uh, to learn uh, about these kinds of things, what kind of data does the platform actually have, 
on you and to be actively engaged and involved in the work that we're doing. So it's a very different approach to what we've previously done uh, in this particular field. So, so what are we doing? There are six uh, work streams in the data sourcing uh, stream, and these are the first four ones, and they are all focused on, on uh, various kinds of data donation. And I think the easiest way for me to explain what these are about is in the case study that I will get into in a few minutes, rather than talking about them in the abstract form. But these are all different ways of, of uh, uh, engaging very actively with participants uh, and um, uh, in the data donation approaches that I mentioned in the previous slide. So while data donation and citizen science is a key data sourcing approach for us, we are uh, building on uh, other um, approaches as well. So one key approach that was, uh, last time I talked about this in, in these kinds of concepts was actually in 2018, I think, and uh, maybe some of you were there, it was a symposium in Canberra hosted by the Academy of the Humanities and uh, I was talking about the digital observatory uh, based at QT at that time. And Marisa Takahashi is now looking after uh, that team. And uh, we were very excited about the fact that we had uh, been able to get that off the ground. So that observatory is based on um, another approach to collect data from platforms that is a bit more traditional, uh, where we collect large data sets and try to make sense of that at, at an aggregate level. Um, that uh, the um, repositories and databases from uh, the, the QT Digital Observatory and the Australian Digital Observatory based uh, at both QT and Melbourne will be important part of uh, what we're doing here as well. And will be expanded and, and, and strengthened um, as part of the Internet Observatory. Um, and the other one is that quite a lot of work that we're doing uh, with data that is very sensitive and very um, uh, uh, hard to get sometimes. It's not even sensitive, it's more than sensitive, you cannot get it. So one approach to, to uh, deal with that is to actually uh, uh, create, uh, we, sometimes we call, it's call it synthetic data and sometimes artificial data, which sounds very weird, but anyway, we somehow are able to simulate or create data that, that are similar to what we get from the real world, but it's not uh, sensitive or, or um, risky at all because it is, call it fake or call it synth uh, synthetic um, and allows us to do experiments and, and uh, work on that data and learn from that in a very respectful way well, because it's not human at all. So we are developing these kinds of data sources as well. So those are the six approaches and again I will get into the data uh, donation approaches in a minute when I talk about the case study. So. Uh, apart from the uh, sourcing the data, we will obviously, as, as all the other uh, programs, um, build um, uh, laboratories and, and ways for researchers and for, for um, communities to get access to the data and understand uh, and explore the data and use that in various kinds of research. Um, so, uh, including a lab workspace and various tools for visualizing and, and um, analyzing the, the data. And the test environments work stream is related to the syn uh, synthetic data stream uh, where we uh, have various kinds of tools and methods for working with these kinds of data sets. And um, building on, um, I'll focus specifically on the ethics and legal part of, of this um, stream uh, and maybe data management as well. Uh, some of the data that we collect are very sensitive and, and from legal points of view and from ethical points of view. And uh, uh, we take that very seriously, obviously. And um, so a big part of what we're doing is to build on the work that we've uh, developed during the past decade on how to deal with these kinds of data sets in an ethical and responsible way. And not all of the data that we collect uh, from the AIO will be possible to make uh, publicly available. So we have to think very carefully about how can we make that as useful as possible for researchers around the country. But that is one part um, that is important here. And I, I uh, obviously 
Uh, we will use care and fair principles, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there are other um, issues that go way beyond uh, those principles that we need to work out. And um, as part of this as well is, is uh, engaging uh, with the communities and, and uh, uh, communication. And the citizen science approach that we have is a very important part of this, right? So um, we, uh, uh, using the citizen science approach, we want to increase data literacy across the country in all kinds of communities. And that is part of this stream as well. Um, so it's not only, even though it's, that's very important to communicate in a more traditional way, but what we're doing, it, that engagement with communities is key. And research training, of course, if, if no one's using our uh, um, facility and our, our repositories, then we've failed. So um, it's important that we include this and make this available for training and education purposes of all kinds. So that's it. Uh, how it fits together, and uh, it's very abstract. So we thought that we should give you um, um, uh, a couple of examples of, of how this actually works, because this is uh, uh, some of these pieces are don't exist. Uh, we will build them, and others have been up and running for a few years. And for instance, the digital observatory has been up and running for uh, six years now. I think is that right, Marisa? Or is it? Um, so. Let me talk about uh, Australian Abs Ad Observatory, and then Damiano will come back and talk about uh, Australian search experience. And both of these uh, uh, projects are based in this uh, center of excellence called Automated Decision Making and Society, ADMS. So, the, uh, and they're examples of data donation approaches. So the uh, Ad Observatory is um, building on uh, a recognition that we, uh, researchers of um, internet platforms are, have experienced um, really difficult uh, situations during the, the past um, six, seven years actually, um, where previous ways for researchers to critically explore what is happening on these platforms have become uh, uh, more and more uh, limited. And Maybe, uh, I don't know if you've seen these kinds of news, uh, but there's something called API, which is a, 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 a method for, for anyone, including researchers, to access data from these platforms. And these gateways, these interfaces, have been uh, gradually uh, diminished and reduced over time. So it's harder and harder to collect data in a structured way from these platforms. So these are examples from Facebook and from Twitter X uh, that have shut these uh, uh, gateways down, not only for researchers, for, for everyone. Um, and this is very important uh, uh, and very uh, problematic, of course, because uh, um, as Damiano said, uh, very important things in our society are playing out on these platforms. And we cannot rely on Facebook to tell us what's going on on Facebook. We need to do uh, independent research uh, of uh, all the good and the bad things that are happening on these platforms. So, um, well, we had to rely on Facebook uh, to some extent. Um, and as Damiana was saying, one approach that these big platforms are giving researchers to replace the APIs is that they set up something that they usually call transparency libraries and say, these are the things that goes on on the platform, use this and uh, you will be fine. And we don't really trust them in that approach, right? And the other one is that they set up digital clean rooms, as they call it, where um, it, it is basically a data lab laboratory hosted by Facebook, hosted by Meta or, or whatever it might be. Uh, where you can play around with uh, data. And we've been working very closely with Meta, for instance, to, to build these kinds of tools. And it's, it's okay, uh, but it's, there are severe limitations with this anyway. But this is what we have. And it looks like this when we do um, use these kinds of tools. Um, for instance, in this particular case where they have ads uh, made available for researchers uh, that uh, the Meta's um, ad li uh, library is available for researchers and we download ads and we uh, make them available for our researchers in the dashboard. Um, 
and use them in the, with various tools for analysis. So straightforward. But we're not happy with this, and this is uh, where the data donation approach comes in. So the Ad Observatory is, uh, has allowed an awful lot of uh, research already. Um, it's uh, focused on uh, environmental uh, uh, issues and consumer finance and all kinds of things, gambling, um, uh, advertising, and so on and so forth, alcohol. And if you look at what this um, project has done, is that in, in, in a technical term, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a plug-in, it's a little piece of software that uh, our participants install on their laptops or computers uh, in their browsers, uh, which uh, uh, monitors um, the ads that they see when they're using Facebook. And we've been uh, fortunate uh, to have almost 2,000 participants in this test uh, in this uh, project and collected um, 300,000 uh, bit more unique ads. So this is the repository that we have at this stage. Um, and it's been going on for, what is it, two and a half? Yeah, something like that, right? Two and a half years, or three and a half? Three and a half years. Okay, thanks. Um, um, but it was shut down in March 2024. Um, but it's, it's been a very successful project. And um, it adds to the data uh, transparency libraries that we talked about. So um, uh, um, shall I? Now uh, let's skip this a little bit. This is the process that we, we went, uh, go through with the um, participants and we sign them up and when we recruit them and we, we help them to uh, install the plugin and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is an important part of that, uh, focused on the uh, digital literacy and, and in, in, uh, making data available for the participants, right? That's super important part of this. So if you're participating in this, you should be able to learn. Independent of the research that is happening, uh, you should be able to learn it. Okay, so this, these are the ads that I'm seeing. Uh, why am I seeing these, and so on and so forth. And that is a principle that we take with us in all kinds of data donation approaches uh, to increase the, uh, the literacy and, and uh, of the participants. So it's not only extractive. Uh, and uh, this is what the process looks like in, in this in when we are uh, working with the, the plugin. Uh, that uh, uh, we have, uh, I'd like to focus particularly on the participant database there at the bottom, which is what we talked about that makes it available, f uh, data available for the participants, uh, and then how we connect the data from the participants with the meta ad library and, cr and create a repository with the ads uh, that we can use for our research and understand what is going on on the platform. Uh, so the researcher dashboard, this doesn't really say very much, but there is a research uh, dashboard available as well for, for our researchers to look into this, to, to analyze and understand the, uh, the ads. So uh, what, what's, uh, we've already done uh, studies with uh, uh, on focused on, on, as I said, gambling and alcohol and so on and so forth. And we've uh, had a, a number of uh, really important publications and quite a lot of attention from mainstream media as well. Uh, but what is next? So uh, from a technical point of view, what's, what we're doing here is that we, we need to obviously move on from uh, the browser and to uh, the mobile because most people or lots of people are using, me included, you included, I'm sure, uh, the mobile to use these platforms. Uh, so we need a slightly different technical approach for that, uh, and we are um, uh, pretty close to launching that as well. And so this is a messy slide, but anyway, uh, what we want to focus on is that we go from a repository of ads to sequences, because it's very important to understand uh, how ads are being positioned next to other types of content. So that's something that we want to understand. 
uh, and explore in, in a critical way. So I think I'll skip that one because we are uh, running short of time and hand over to Damiano to talk about the next uh, case, which is the Australian search experience. Thank you, Patrick. I'm aware that we are not having a lot of time, but I just wanted to show like an additional case study to show that the approach of uh, data donations is reproducible to other platforms and other uh, use cases. So this was a, another ADMS project called the Australian Search Experience that uh, similar to, to the one that uh, Patrick mentioned was the idea was to try to understand how do people, what do people see when they uh, uh, search for specific keywords. Um, and then if there is any personalization happening there. So it was basically there are uh, this theory of filter bubbles and we wanted to collect evidence to understand is this really happening or not. Um, so the, it was launched in late July 2021. Uh, for over 12 months, uh, we collected 350 million search results for more than 1,000 participants. Um, and yeah, again, that was the uh, citizen science approach, uh, relying on, on data donations and using a desktop browser plugin. And what the plugin would do is run behind the scenes without having the user needing to interact with their, it's not collecting their own queries, it was collecting uh, for a specific set of queries what the search results would uh, deliver from Google, uh, Google, Google News, and YouTube uh, as well. Um, and this was uh, building up on a, a, a study uh, uh, run by Algorithm Watch in, uh, in Germany in 2017. And the, the main goal was to observe uh, and quantify personalization in, on, of search results. What do you think we find out? What the, was the result of this? Did we find filter bubbles, yes or no? Yeah? yeah? Not really. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and uh, and it was. A, 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 it's it's interesting to see, no? Like it, like well, this is the type of things that you can do when you have a, a infrastructure that allows you to do in a, in a somewhat a large scale uh, uh, access to to evidence, no? Of what what do people see when they run this type of queries? Um, so. We, uh, it was highly, in, in both in terms of sources uh, that you will see in Google News, for instance, was pretty consistent across users. Uh, and the, what you find is not personalization, but contextualization, which is for uh, the local. No? So if you are uh, looking at news in a particular place in Australia, you will see different news than in another place. But that's not related with the context of the user. It's, is related with the context of where the user is running the search from. That's, those two things are different. What is the thing that we haven't uh, explored here is that we have a predefined set of keywords. So then the filter bubble approach might come from how people search, not, and this is throwing the ball to you, it's not the algorithm, it's how people search. So that's the thing that we need to start studying. And that's what we, are studying the upcoming uh, ADMS project, Australian Search Experience 2.0. Um, so, and again, like we, the aim is to use the infrastructure from AIO to be able to do these type of things. So we could use data donations and cross-sourcing platforms to have a large scale uh, uh, range of users donating their interactions with the, with the search engines or collecting if we give an information need I need to find a, a, a place to eat uh, in, in Melbourne. What do you type when you have that information need? And we might have a common information need reflected in different queries that then might come up with different search results. Um, we could also look at uh, using a, a th synthetic data and generative AI to say, okay, we, if we have some keywords some queries related to this information need, can we expand that so to have a broader set of potential ways of formulating an information need? Um, develop an understanding of how non-traditional search interfaces and contextual fa uh, factors drive query variation. This is looking at 
running user studies to say, well, if I use if I use Bing Chat or I use Google, do I interact with the system differently, and how is that? So, um, and finally, looking at what happens with the link between the search results and knowledge graphs, such as Wikimedia data, and understanding the relation. What is the content that people see when they run those queries? Thanks for your time and for listening to us. Thank you. Are, are there any quick questions? Thanks. Fascinating presentations. Does the data that you've gotten through active consent give you information that the tech platforms themselves don't have, or at least don't have legally? I would assume that the answer is no, because the data that we ask them to donate is coming from the platform. Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I guess that the other side, once you have in the other side of like uh, getting that c data um, uh, citizen science community, you will learn more about those. Yet. So if you ask demographic factors and things like that, that might not be reflected in the platforms yet. We, we might be able to add that, that uh, in addition to the demographic data, one part uh, of this is that we we um, will add qualitative uh, data to at least some parts of, of these um, studies uh, to really understand in depth uh, the experiences that the participants have, and uh, 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 which I think will be very important. And, and again, in the same way as Damiana was talking about the demographics, that's obviously something that we, the, the platforms don't have. Just in the spirit of the data commons, how much of your tooling is, for example, common to ATAP and LDACA? So you're doing textual analytics. At, at this stage, none, I would say. But I think that's one of the, the really interesting, exciting uh, parts of, of uh, uh, this initiative and, and being uh, supported by ARDC and being in this family. Uh, that there are so many opportunities and I think everyone in the room has experienced the same thing during the past few days that uh, we we need to explore and understand how we can combine uh, the these six programs uh, because there are so many overlaps I, t I fully uh, agree with, with what you're um, hinting at that there should be much stronger uh, relations uh, between those two uh, programs and, and also other programs that we've heard about here, yeah. You also make great videos, so perhaps you could share that. <laughs> <laughs> so shout out to our colleague Natalie Campbell from ADMS. That is not the only great video that she made, but we have the luxury of having an amazing comms team at ADMS that I think puts our, our initiatives in a different level, yeah. Shout out and a call for more investment to communications of research infrastructure and research in general, if we can. Yeah. What are you saying about Christmas Eve geography? Nothing in her absence. No more question. Oh, one more. It's about. Well, I don't know if it's more of much of a question, but more of like a, like a fan ask. So it's. Um, when uh, criticism that we often hear in the social sciences is that we like to look for the bad in what we have, and you know, it's like oh, looking back and look, being green and, and not being creative enough and looking enough to the future. And so when I see you guys developing these super amazing capabilities, I think, like, what are your plans? If you have any, just to get me excited, if you have any, um, on say using those kinds of yeah capabilities to uh, design like socially positive uh, social platforms and you know those kinds of things um, 
is there a space for that? It, or would the setup be super different? I don't know. I don't know if you're going to answer your question, but I think one of the main benefits of this uh, initiative is not like you might think oh, ah, we are extracting data from from platforms that are is not available there. I think the, the ultimate goal is not extracting the data, is giving agency to the users of the platforms. So by by engaging with the, with the users as uh, um, science citizens, we hope to get more aware of, okay, this is what's happening with my data there, which that is the thing that could uh, uh, contribute to build better uh, social media platforms, yeah. But I think I think it's a core thing. Like, I mean, many of the platforms have been bottom-up driven. You know, if you see the the evolution of Twitter, how the ideas of retweet hashtags those came from the users, not from the platform. So I think that we we shape the, the the platform somehow. What we need is more agency on how we can do that more effectively and more safely. Yeah. Thank you, Damiano. Grazie. I like the visual uh, explanations that you put up, actually. Um, now, our second last presentation today is going to take on a bit of a theatrical performance mode, I feel. <laughs> it's a team effort, and I'm going to introduce Caroline Wake. Do you want me to talk to... Do you buy a Caroline or...? Caroline's deadly in the daytime and the nighttime. She works in the Senior Lecturer of Theatre and Performance at the University of New South Wales, a member of the Force Migration Research Network and Associate of Australian Human Rights Institute. Her research focuses on relationship between theatre and history, how theatre responds and represents history, and conversely, how theatre's own history is archived and recounted, especially in Australia. And then I'll let you introduce your team as you, as you choose. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's my privilege to introduce the Australian Creative Histories and Futures Project. And together with my colleagues, who are hiding for some reason, <laughs> my colleague, Dr. Brianna Trezais, also a senior lecturer in theatre and performance at the University of New South Wales. Associate Professor Maggie Nolan from the University of Queensland and Director of Ostlit, and Professor Chris Hay from Flinders University uh, and Director of Ausstage, a performing arts um, uh, database. And I'm pleased to introduce Caitlin Vaughan from Creative Australia, as well as online Rebecca Moston, also from Creative Australia. Um, so we'd like to begin by acknowledging country. There we are. We don't yet have a comms and engagement team in place, um, and it's going to show in the slides, and we don't have a slick video. I have a position description ready to go, um, but I don't yet have approval to advertise. So here we are, and I'm going to apologise because I can, or I already know that we are missing two, not one, but two logos. Um, but I'd like to begin by acknowledging country. So we are so grateful to be here, and I've been here for the past three days on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to Elders past and present, and we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders everywhere. We'd especially like to acknowledge our Indigenous colleagues working on various projects across the ARDC's House and Indigenous Research Data Commons, um, as well as the First Nations authors, artists, and scholars whose work this project hopes to amplify. So I myself, um, we are scattered across Australia. I myself live on Darkenjung country, and we variously live and work on Gadigal, Bidjigal, um, Turrbal and Ghana lands. So the structure of this presentation will take its cue from our project name, uh, the, the Australian Creative Histories and Futures. I was very careful to avoid the possibility of the acronym CHAF, um, CHAF, which didn't seem like a good idea. <laughs> Um, but we are absolutely thrilled to be in such esteemed company and we've learned so much from researchers um, across these other projects and we were doubly delighted to see our new little tile or logo and we are incredibly grateful to Goring Goring artist Dylan Sara for that and for Jenny Fuster facilitating our use of it. 
So I am going to briefly sketch out under the rubric of creative, um, the Australian creative and cultural data sector as it stands now. And from there, I'll invite my colleagues to take us from the abstract into the concrete and to talk about specific assets and their shared and individual histories. So Maggie will speak in her capacity as director of Austlit. Chris, Hay, Chris will speak in his capacity as director of Ausstage, and then I'll hand over to Creative Australia. Uh, and lastly, my colleague and co-lead, Brioni, will give us a glimpse into futures. Here we are. So what is cultural data? So in essence, the Australian Creative Histories, or ACHF project as I'll call it from now, aims to anchor and augment Australia's cultural data sector. Cultural data is uh, data produced at any stage in what UNESCO terms the cultural cycle, which involves the creation, production, dissemination, and depending on your particular art form, it might be the exhibition, reception, or transmission. Um, or, and uh, a kind of stage of consumption and participation. This is not an especially accurate analytic tool and uh, UNESCO themselves refer to it more as a sensitization model rather than an, uh, an analytical aid. One of the things that uh, it captures, however, or suggests uh, is the interconnection between those activities, including the feedback processes by which one activity, say consumption, reading a book, might inspire the creation of a new cultural product or artefact, say you might be inspired to write another book. What we know from cultural data sets is that they tend to capture one aspect of that um, cycle. They don't often capture all of that cycle, nor do they capture the feedback loops. And that's one of the things this project is interested in um, look, investigating. UNESCO also refers to cultural domains. I'm not going to get into that particular debate today. Instead, I'm going to talk to the issue of who collects cultural data. So we know that government agencies collect cultural data. So it might be your local council, it might be your state arts agency, it might be a federal department. And within the, even at the federal level, it might be Creative Australia, but it might also be the Office of the Arts, it might be Treasury or someone else. We know that collecting institutions, such as galleries, libraries, archives and museums, also collect cultural data. Universities often house their own mini-glam sector. They themselves have galleries, libraries, archives and museums on campuses. But they also are usually, um, have disciplinary databases that are often funded collaboratively but anchored at particular institutions. Philanthropic organisations also collect cultural data, uh, and I'm thinking here of a, a think tank like A New Approach, um, which has previously worked in partnership with um, the Academy of Humanities, and just published another report last week on um, collaboration. <coughs> peak bodies also collect their own data, and it might be a peak body like Theatre Network Australia, or it might be an, a peak body like the Small Press Network. We all, um, uh, they are also collecting data. Then there are independent collections held by companies or publications, and this is where I have done a lot of my own research. Uh, I worked, for example, with Performance Space, a small arts organisation based in Sydney that has been working at the forefront of experimental arts practices for approximately 40 years. That archive is in relatively good shape. I have to say I did recognise the, um, from the, uh, the video of Yurikala the state of that archive. I saw some similarities in the state of um, some of the small to medium arts organisations struggling to manage their own um, archives. Um, then there are individuals. So we know that artists, artists, authors and researchers gather materials over the course of their career and uh, often sort of end up with stray data sets or even boxes under the bed, um, kind of, cu of cultural data. So the point is that no one has a complete picture, that the data varies immensely, as do methodologies, and as does resourcing. So the picture is mixed, you might say. So on the one hand, and I'll start with our strengths, there, um, Australia is recognised as a leader in this area. We have amassed major collections of cultural data um, across an array of disciplines. So for example, in literature via Auslit, uh, in the performing arts via Ausstage and, uh, and the Circus Oz Living Archive, in the visual arts you know, um, via the Dow, for example, film and in other fields via the Australian um, Dictionary of Biography, to, to give you one example. There have also been important projects that have come 
combined some of these and other data sets, so for example, Honey or the Australian Cultural Data Engine. There are, however, significant challenges, and um, we could um, talk you through all of them, but I'm just going to touch on what emerges in both in the literature and in the co-design um, and in conversations with industry, the sort of three major challenges. And they are sustainability, interoperability, and Indigenous data governance. So um, what we need is to return to the warp and weft metaphor, or um, one of um, Jenny's beautiful diagrams. If we have three data sets from Ausstage, Auslit, and Creative Australia, then these are the sort of three shared challenges across each of those. So sustainability, um, and we're defining this in the broadest possible sense. So here we mean not only financial sustainability or technical sustainability, but also social sustainability. So we know from various scholars and reports over the years, um, some of which um, Inga rehearsed uh, yesterday, and um, Sandra and Kristen and Levi provided a, a helpful um, co or counter history as well, that um, short term project based funding has built much of the infrastructure we have in this country, but that makes it difficult to strategize and plan and it makes it difficult to create efficiencies at a national scale. Um, it can bring projects to um, a premature end. Uh, we can lose project staff as they, um, both research staff and technical staff seek more stable positions elsewhere. Um, and it can, uh, that in turn impacts on um, obviously technical and, sorry, I went old school because I had a computer go down in a lecture last week and I thought, I'm just going to print things out as well. <laughs> um, and this is where I think the ARDC's decision to invest in a creative arts project is potentially transformed to start to move, and admittedly this move will be slow, it will be gradual and it will be incremental, but to move the cultural data sector out of an endless series of LEAF and linkage grants and onto the slightly steadier cycle of ARDC, which provides more money over more years, I think provides us with a really exciting opportunity. I won't touch on interoperability, uh, Maggie and Chris will very briefly. I will speak briefly to Indigenous data governance. So it is very clear, even though this project has been under embargo, word seems to have leaked, and we are already fielding requests um, uh, and interest not only from other indus potential industry partners, but also from um, other uh, universities, uh, collecting institutions. And it, it's clear that uh, the sector has this front of mind is struggling immensely with appropriate access and is sometimes swinging between two extremes. So some institutions, often but not only large cultural institutions, have many policies and processes in place such that access is almost impossible, resulting in um, what Nick and his team has called the new protectionism. Other institutions, often but not only smaller cultural um, organisations, have no policies in place or processes in place, but know that they need them uh, and have often and have sort of started approaching people trying to find out what they should be doing. Um, and when you have even a preliminary conversation, you discover they have no data management plan, let alone um, a plan to manage Indigenous data. So I think that's one of, again, the exciting and challenging um, uh, aspects of the project will be that um, engagement and outreach and sector uplift to um, across. So these are the aims that are outlined in our project plan. We want to secure existing data assets by strengthening their technical, financial and social architectures. We want to facilitate interoperability and we want to develop Indigenous data governance um, as well as upskill stakeholders in cultural data management and access. But rather than continuing to talk about cultural data in the abstract, I'd like now to hand over to Maggie, who can speak to the particular holdings of Ostlit. Um, thank you so much, Caroline, and hello, everybody. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we are on the beautiful lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to Elders past and present and all First Nations people in the room here today. I want to particularly thank you, Grant, for your very generous, spirited approach to the whole symposium. It's, it's been really lovely. Um, I also want to thank 
Sandra, Professor Sandra Phillips, our time didn't cross over at UQ, but I know you've been a long time supporter of Auslit and I really am very grateful to you for that. Okay, so um, what is Auslit? Um, Auslit is a comprehensive biobibliographical database of Australian literature and storytelling. It evolved in the 1980s from a need to integrate and house a range of existing specialist bibliographical projects that were scattered throughout the country. Um, it started as a card index actually at UNSW Duntroon, um, now UNSW Canberra, and it subsequently incorporated multiple bibliographical data sets from many, many institutions, mostly supported by ARC funds in the way you were speaking about. Uh, expanding into f theatre, film and TV scripts over the years as well. Um, Auslit now has over a million work records and over 200,000 agent records. Auslit really is unique. No other country has attempted to map its literary field in this way and with Auslit, Australia boasts the most com comprehensive online bibliographical archive of a national literature anywhere in the world. The focus has been on building the technical and intellectual research infrastructure to support scholarship in Australian literary, film and theatre studies. After a brief life as a CD-ROM in the 1990s, <laughs> Auslit went online in September 2001, I think making it one of the oldest digital humanities projects in the country. This online iteration included an advanced search function built around a data model based on FERBA, um, which I won't talk too much about now, um, which enables kind of networked uh, relations between what, when you're searching. And because OSLIT was constructed according to established bibliographical standards that were in place prior to the integration of the records, there is a lot of consistency across the database. Um, and so with Auslit's um, search function, really nuanced uh, explorations of the literary field are possible that wouldn't otherwise be possible. Um, so for many years, Auslit was led by a consortium of universities. Now it is housed at the University of Queensland. Um, but I really want to stress that Auslit is the result of the labours of a huge number of individuals and institutions. All the data, all those records, um, have been manually entered by human indexes and decisions are made every day about what and how to index works of literature. Um, Auslit also um, hosts an ever-expanding range of curated data sets, online exhibitions, research projects, teaching resources and analyses, over 75 at last count, um, and including our most significant data set, um, and I think one of our most significant achievements, um, Black Words, which is a record of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander storytelling that was launched in 2007 at the State Library of Queensland by Uncle Sam Watson. Professor Anita Heist was the first coordinator of Black Words, and we actually have, I can say now, a new Black Words coordinator, Melanie Saywood, um, who is starting um, next week, next Monday. So this is great. Um, and I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the other um, curated data sets and projects we've had at um, OSLIT. OSLIT also nurtures a number of successful partnerships. Relations, relationships and re relationality are central to what we do. Beyond just the data model and the search function, actually relationships between people and institutions. Um, we are currently collaborating um, on a number of funded projects and all of these incredible projects, um, which can only be done in digital environments, cement, cement Auslit's place as national research infrastructure and as an asset that both enables and builds on research. Um, we're also currently partnering um, in a, on a range of other projects, uh, linking records between Auslit, Trove and the To Be Continued database at ANU, for example, um, with the Australian Book Review, uh, linking to their digitised archive, um, with the Foundation for Australian Studies in China, with scholarly and teachers associations, and with the Outer Foundation Building Digital Learning Environments. Um, and now um, we have the great privilege and pleasure to be partnering 
with UNSW and Flinders and Creative Australia and the ARDC, which we're completely thrilled about. Um, so I'm sure it won't be right to say what's our biggest challenge, and I think everyone's biggest challenge is probably the same, and it's um, money, resources, funding. Yeah, so I'm sure it won't surprise you to learn that that is also our greatest challenge or one of our greatest challenges. Um, OSLIT is a subscription database which pays for its wonderful team who are here today, our brilliant content manager, Katrina Mills, Dr. Katrina Mills, and our programmer, um, Brendan John. So thanks for coming, guys, and Jonathan as well, who's with the UQ's Research Computing Centre. So that's what our subs pay for, or your subs pay for, <laughs> mine too, I guess. The team ensures OSLIT's data remains comprehensive, reliable, and up-to-date, and that we can engage with our user communities. Um, at the same time, we are working to make OSLIT as accessible as possible to everyone. Scholars, librarians, teachers, writers, critics, readers who want to make the most of it. But it's a very difficult line to walk, this line between openness and financial sustainability. And it's um, one of the things that we're really eager to explore in this project. So. Now I'm going to um, hand over to my colleague, Professor Chris Hay, who is the director of Ostage at Flinders. Thanks, mate. No Great. You'll um, recognise parts of this story. But uh, Ostage, which is the Australian Life Performance Database, similarly began as a loose collaboration of Australian university partners emerging out of the Australasian Drama Studies Association before developing into a public-facing database sometime in the early 2000s. We tried to have a 21st birthday party and everybody who was there gave me a different date, so sometime in the early 2000s after Auslit. <laughs> Um, since then, it's grown to encompass more than 500,000 records across a number of different categories that you can see on the top right of your screen there. Ausstage is an event-oriented database. That is, it's arranged around individual instances of live performance, uh, which was a decision made to recognise the centrality of the event uh, to live performance. But it's also one of the things that kind of limits our, our collaborative interoperable ability because live performance is somewhat unique in, in its, in its eventness, if you like. Each event record has associated venues and contributors and genres and so on. The collection has grown so significant as to be inscribed on the UNESCO Memory of the World Register, recognising that, and I'm just going to quote from that citation, Ostage has become a key source of documentation demonstrating the research and impact of the arts and the role of live performance in a readily accessible form. By collecting and recording distinct performance events, Ausstage plays a vital role in maintaining the memory of live performance in Australia. There is nothing comparable in the world. And that idea of maintaining the memory is, is another of the kind of um, interesting tension points for us because a lot of our user base, a lot of our colleagues see the resource as a kind of static data set that records the past. And part of what we're trying to do in this project is open out forwards to become a more, uh, a more living database that powers creative activity into the future. Some of the international um, uh, comparative points are in fact built um, on Ausstage's infrastructure. You can see on the home page there, uh, one of the examples is Ibsen Stage, the uh, University of Oslo's uh, database, um, and Theatre Aotearoa in New Zealand, with whom we've uh, just finished a major data harmonisation project, which will uh, mean in the near future that you can search across Australian and New Zealand records in a single search, um, to give you a sense of the way uh, creative practice is, is networked across our region. And this will realise the final aim of our seventh LEAF grant, which was titled The International Breakthrough, which attempts to map some of the international reach uh, of Australian performance. Given all of our records are geolocated, including the venues and the event records, you can see here, this is just from the home page, it, it shows you the, the number of records in each place um, across time. As even those few sentences of introduction suggest, like Auslit, the collection grew around discrete projects, but it now aims uh, to more complete coverage. 
Records range from 1788 to 2024, from the famed Mud Hut performance of the recruiting officer for Captain Arthur Phillip, uh, through to Counting and Cracking, which is on across the road uh, at the moment as part of the Rising Festival. So the data set is comprehensive without always being detailed. It can tell us a lot about trends and broad patterns and less about individual instances, unless those individual data sets are audited, cleaned and augmented. And this means that individual researchers and data enterers, all of whom are volunteers, have an outsized impact and influence on the data set. And that's the key challenge that we're working through. And I'm just gonna illustrate that um, by telling you a quick story. As part of Ausstage's work with the Australian Cultural Data Engine, and I'm grateful to colleagues on the Engine project, Dr. Justin Munoz and Ivy Seng for their help in uh, putting this data together, we pulled a list of the people who have, the contributors who have the most records in Ausstage, basically saying who, who is the most active in the performing arts in Australia. And this was the list we got. A lot of it conformed to what we assumed, um, that most of the people towards the top of the list are designers, particularly lighting designers. Lighting design, very specialised. There's a couple of very in-demand um, designers, and you can see them represented at the top. The name at the top, though, was one that was not familiar to me. I was, uh, as an Australian theatre historian, ready to, to hand back my professional credentials. Uh, I have no idea who uh, Robert Taylor was. I was talking to my colleague Liz Larkin, the current Ausstage project manager, and I said, have you got any idea? Is this a, a colonial era actor that I haven't heard of in my ignorance? And she said, oh no, Robert's one of our volunteers. <laughs> and what this represents is the fact that one of our very dedicated volunteers, who's been working in the performing arts in this country for 60 years, has put in every show he's ever done. <laughs> And he is attached to 371 records, which is some, uh, some 85 more than Jeff Cobham, Australia's most celebrated lighting designer. Indeed, um, when you drill down into the different types of roles that people have held, these are people who've held more than one artistic function. So they've been an actor and a director or a lighting designer and a set designer. Robert has held 32 separate roles um, in, Australian, uh, in Australian performance. And then the next person down, Catherine, Catherine Fitzgerald, who's an actor director. Um, and you'll recognize people like Eddie Perfect and, and Jim Sharman um, on that list. And indeed, when you drill down into Robert's own um, <coughs> Robert's own record, you can see in the notes that he's put in uh, there a sense of, um, a sense of the, the, the connections uh, that he has across Australian performance history. And uh, the note there at the end there, the only person who worked on all five Canberra Theatre Trust January productions, 1979 to 83, and, and they're named there. Um, and part, part of this example is, uh, is in, in just to sort of say, you know, it's a, it's a fun way of being called out by your own database. But the other point is that I, when I first saw this, I sort of thought, oh my gosh, I can't, well, I can't rely on any of the data anymore because I, I, I'm, we're, we're seeing the extent to which individual data entry has a huge impact on our holdings. On the other hand, Robert's record is a genuine record of how most Australians engage with the arts. That someone who worked professionally, who worked in community theatre, who held that, those 32 separate roles from painting the set to working the front desk to being the technical director and production manager of, of some of the most significant theatre companies in Australian history. And this is really our key challenge as we move forward. Like Auslit, it's sustainability. But for us, it's moving, uh, it's rethinking the way in which our volunteer-led data entry model affects the nature of the data that we collect. Uh, and one of the uh, key ways that, that the AIDC project will help us think that through is in, in comparing notes with, with our fellow uh, database holders and also thinking through how we can start to embrace more automated collection techniques and ways that mean that we don't stop collecting the rich data that our volunteers have offered us, but that, that we can take a more nuanced approach to their presence uh, in the data set. I will leave it there for our specific um, contribution to this section. I'm handing over now to colleagues from Creative Australia, and I believe Rebecca is online. So it may take us a moment just to, to sort that through, but Rebecca will give us an introduction to Creative Australia's uh, potential role in the project. Thank you. I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. Yep, excellent. 
Um, so I'm joining today from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation back at the office here in Sydney. Um, and yes, I'm the Director of Research from Creative Australia. Um, we're pretty excited to be involved in this project. Uh, a bit of background on our organisation. So Creative Australia is the Australian government's principal funding and advisory body. And it was established through the government's national cultural policy called Revive in 2023. So Revive transformed what was the 50-year-old Australia Council for the Arts into Creative Australia. And as part of that, it expanded our remit and added new functions and dedicated investment. Um, these include the addition of Music Australia and Writers Australia, which will deepen engagement with the commercial parts of these sectors. Um, and then also Creative Workplaces, which is, has a role to support artists and arts workers as workers. Um, and the um, integration of the functions of what was Creative Partnerships Australia as part of Creative Australia brings the, the public, private and commercial sectors closer together. Um, and you might have noticed that um, there was legislation before Parliament recently to establish a First Nations self-determined body within our agency. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not sure if, I think we did have some slides, but they're not absolutely essential. So I might just keep going. I'm not seeing them at the moment. Um, so in terms of our research and data, we've invested in thousands of individuals, groups and organisations over the past 50 plus years as Creative Australia and previously as the Australia Council for the Arts. So our internal information and data holdings are, are, are rich and complex um, and we'll be expanding in as we kind of take on the, um, these new functions. So they'll be expanding in a sort of a range of different directions. Um, but also alongside uh, our kind of central function to invest in arts, in artists and, and organisations, we also have a legislative mandate to conduct and commission research about the arts and to evaluate the impact of the organisation's um, support uh, and activities. So these are really essential parts of how we inform policy advice to government um, and also internal decision making and strategic planning and advocacy is one of our key roles as well. So our research is, um, it, it supports all of those activities. It's also designed to support the sector with information um, that is useful uh, for artists and arts organisations out there on the ground. Um, so information around arts practice, audiences and markets, um, and it also provides uh, evidence that forms a basis of Creative Australia's targeted submissions to government inquiries and, and reviews, which of which we, um, we do quite a few. Uh, um, and we also have active working relationships, specifically around research with the state and territory government arts bodies, as well as with our sister agency, Screen Australia, and the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So um, in terms of uh, those sort of um, government needs that Caroline talked about at the beginning, um, we're quite connected uh, to those other parts of government and the Office of the Arts um, around those discussions about research and data. Um, and in addition, we have regular interaction with several of our international counterparts through an informal research network. So we're often talking to the Canada Council for the Arts and Creative New Zealand, et cetera. Um, so moving now to, I guess, what we see is the opportunities for the this project, the Australian Creative Histories and Futures Project. Um, under Revive, there's an increasing emphasis on data and evaluation and impact so there are real synergies between um, the ACHF project and the National Cultural Policy. And Revive also charges us with delivering a triennial state of Australian culture report, which is quite a large project. Um, and that's going to need to draw on a, a wide range of research and data from a variety of sources. Um, and this project potentially has, opens up a whole lot of new opportunities to feed into um, that triennial kind of uh, health check, I guess, is what we've been asked to, to um, pull together. 
Um, and in terms of our own role on the project, we're still at the scoping stage and the ink isn't quite dry on, a, on our contract yet. Um, we're still working on those logistics, but it is our intention to come on board as a partner. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, and as Caroline mentioned right at the beginning, there's lots of questions that our sector has um, and that, ha that they haven't been able to um, explore before due to capacity or access or, or a whole range of reasons. And that, that includes things that um, uh, better research infrastructure can help to address. We recognise the expectations of the sector that we carry as Creative Australia, including the data that we collect and hold from the organisations and, and individuals who apply to us for support. Um, and we also recognise the many challenges that um, our colleagues have spoken about in terms of uh, working with data. We have those with our own data as well. Um, it includes things from sensitive, handling sensitive data, and even just whether the data that has been collected for delivering programs is actually fit for purpose for research. It's sort of an internal kind of um, process we go through ourselves quite regularly. Um, uh, but we, yeah, but we are really excited at what we could bring to this project and what might be explored together. Um, we're keen to see how it will strengthen the capability of our sector um, to tell the many st stories about the impacts of the arts, the impacts of their activities, um, and the relationships and intersections between researchers and artists to demonstrate this impact. Um, so we're, yeah, we're really looking forward to working with our partners and the ARDC to um, progress this research infrastructure project for the for creative arts. And I'm just going to hand to Caitlin, who's in the room now. She's going to talk a little bit more about from, from being on the ground there in, in Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and their elders, pay my respects, and also thank Grant for reminding me that Little Lunch still exists. Um, it's been a, a really um, amazing couple of days to be here on the ground and really grateful for the generosity um, of the conversation so far. As, it's still, as Rebecca mentioned, it's still very fresh, but I thought I'd just share a quick example um, here uh, shared, um, which is an image from uh, Mughal and Performing Arts, as, which is one of the, I think, 130 or so multi-year funded organisations of Creative Australia, um, shared with permission of Mughal and Performing Arts to Creative Australia. Uh, and in the visitors, uh, Murawari playwright and author Jane Harrison reimagines the arrival of the First Fleet from a First Nations perspective. Um, and I share this because I sat down um, not long ago with Jane, the author and playwright, and also Lily Shearer from Mughal and Performing Arts about the genesis of this work. It was a very non-directed uh, conversation, exploratory conversation we were having about um, how Mughal and Performing Arts, which does such impactful work, documents and could start to demonstrate their impact. Uh, and it was before and unrelated to, as, as Rebecca mentioned, a very fresh conversation with the AIDC and this partnership. But it's a really interesting example of the challenge and opportunity for the questions we have and we might bring and start to explore in this project. Um, because the visitors began life as a story by Jane. Um, she talked about the genesis of it. Uh, and, um, and Lily also talked about the process of development, um, including some very, for both of them, very deep engagement with community. Uh, and and that's, that, that was very in, influential in the creative development process. Uh, it included, you know, um, a showing and uh, development project process at the Yellamundi Festival, uh, where, where the new works go through a workshopping and development stage and are presented to community and to peers for, for public showings and yarning and feedback. Um, there was a first performance, of course, of the, of the visitors at the Sydney Festival in 2020. Um, and more recently at the Sydney Opera House, where it has, it has, it has a recent season um, in partnership with the Sydney Theatre Theater Company. And of course, more recently, as those of you um, locally might know, that Jane worked with direct composer Christopher Sainsbury and the Victorian Opera to reimagine and present the work as an opera um, at, at Art Centre Melbourne in 2023. 
Um, and, and really, but the conversation we're having with Lily and Jane was just the journey of the work, the different ways in which it's been through different processes, but also significant and undocumented impacts and outcomes it has had with the artists involved, with communities involved. Um, it would be a, a, an entry in Auslit, it would be an entry or maybe two entries in Ostage, um, but being here and connecting into this project, it just really opens up new ways to think about where the data about these works and these processes exist in many different places with many different organizations with very limited resources um, but doing really really important work um, and wanting to share that story and be able to to demonstrate how impactful it is so um, yeah as we said we're very new to the conversation and very new to this partnership but very excited about what what we might um, explore, and in particular, um, very, very, uh, very, very um, encouraged by the partnerships and connections to the Indigenous data governance and building Indigenous research capabilities work as well, and LIDACA. Um, it's been really, really uh, um, a, a great experience for us to be able to make those connections and start to build those conversations. Thank you. <laughs> Time, but um, Brioni, do you want to come up? And oh, okay. Speak? All right. Yeah. Or do, do, do you want to speak very briefly to? Yeah. It's up to you guys. Right. I'm just it's up aware working of time. together in yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah. Model it. Shall I just go? It's up to you. Okay. Time. We'll just go some big picture stuff. Um, I don't want to be the face that holds you uh, uh, away from afternoon tea because you'll hate me forever. So I'm just going to thank you so much. That's just. A beautiful segue, I think, actually. What I wanted to do very quickly in closing is um, maybe just draw a few big picture threads about what, why this project, what does it mean? And in listening across the last three days, um, I always go back to why is it that I teach in the arts and research in the arts and work in the arts? Because for me, they are the original infrastructure. They are, they are the ecosystem that we live and breathe and share our stories through our emotions through our genealogies, they, they carry our culture and of course um, our First Nations colleagues know this better and more fully than any of us, so there's a lot to learn there as well. But when I'm, uh, when I'm thinking about uh, futures and uh, the kind of the, the more data framed language of interoperability, what I really like to think about is how the arts are a practice and a metaphor of interoperability as well. And I wanted to just draw that thread of connection for you in your minds about how we're trying to conceive of the interoperability of these data systems, because really what they're about is about their, they are about um, helping us tell better, richer stories about the value of the arts. Um, so for, uh, you will have heard this already, you would have gleaned this already, but we can start to tell stories about what began as a little kernel of a literary career has now become a film with high export potential. What began as a series of experiments in dance practice are now innovations that anchor new developments in visual arts curation. We know, we are the audiences. We don't just attend a theatre event or a dance event or a music event. We're reading the novel that was written by the author who studied theatre with the director whose theatre work they're now seeing. These are the histories we want to understand because they share languages in creative practice, in creative process. Those languages are so important, not just to the artists and the makers and the people who have, who have uh, uh, engineered them, but they are increasingly important to all kinds of futures that our young people are going to be navigating through. So when we talk about interoperability in this project, we want to make the inherent interoperability of the arts more visible. And, and we want to do this because we want to open out conversations across stakeholders and end users um, in a way that helps our society better understand the arts, as a, as the arts and culture as, as a core kind of pillar in its own right. Uh, very quickly, we're going to be doing this through these streams. <laughs> they, they touch on sustainability, they touch on interoperability, and they very, very importantly touch on reparative description and Indigenous ontologies as well. Uh, 
They also help us think about the applications of cultural memory in terms of futures. So when we start to have the data about the arts, we can talk about what the arts do, not just in terms of telling us what we've done, but how we can do more better uh, with, with what the arts do. And we were just talking about this. This came out of the Partner Day particularly, so that was really helpful for us in uh, understanding those cross feeds. Uh, and, and cross feeds connect to things, I'm, I'm realising now I've got different things on my slides to my words, so I'll speak to the words here. Things around, uh, th themes around resilient communities recovering from disaster, themes around what, what kinds of arts and creative practices most effectively enable young people in building creative careers, what contribution do those careers make to economies of scale, what forms of creative participation enable ageing populations to maintain heightened levels of health and well-being? These are the stories we want to be able to tell because these are the stories that help us build capacity in the arts across generations. Uh, most, most centrally, however, let me just scroll down, is uh, our questions around how making more visible, more careful, um, and, uh, and more respectful uh, maintenance of the Indigenous register uh, within, within that system is how that helps us will understand the stories and legacies of, of those particular cultural practices and how ha they have kind of anchored and maintained and shaped our bigger artistic ecologies. So I think there are, there's already there, but there are, there are bigger stories to tell and understand through that as well. Um, so this is what we're hoping to do expand understandings of aesthetic genealogies, um, their histories and how they support creative careers and communities. We are also going to be developing new methods. We're working with what our project plan calls uh, creative domain experts, mm -hmm. but that's actual secret code for artists mm -hmm. um, uh, who are going to be working with the data in creative ways to communicate creatively um, what the stories around the data. Um, how amazing would it be in two years if we could come back and share a method that Aldaka or, or another project wants to pick up? How amazing would it be to understand some of those innovations travelling into other, other scholarly domains, if you like? You're probably going, no, yeah, uh, wait, you wait, two years we'll be back. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, um, uh, particularly strengthened by working with Creative Australia is our, our strong commitment and ability to be advancing policy conversations in cultural participation, economic, economic contribution of the arts and also cultural investment in it. So thank you ARDC and thank you team, team um, Australian Creative Histories and Futures, newly formed and ready to go. And everyone please have some coffee and tea. <laughs> hey. um, there's supposed to be some flavours come up here. Um, okay. I had all this plan of how I'd do it, and then uh, these two critters come along and says they've got to go early, so I'm going to put them at the front of it. And it reminds me of um, I was when I was working at uh, what is now the QUT, but the old Brisbane College of Advanced Education at Kelvin Grove, uh, where we were running a program for training secondary and first um, early childhood teachers. One of the things we used to do would was take as many as we could fit onto a 22-seater bus and sometimes a smaller bus to go out to Carnarvon Gorge and then up to Aurobinda. And um, I remember one time we went along there and there was this friendship between a um, Torres Strait Island woman and uh, a, one of her uh, white mates. They come along there and we were standing at Aurobinda there at the beginning of the day and in a matter of 10 minutes, there were three different changes of what we were going to do because of the dynamics of what goes on in the community. And I'm sure you are aware of that kind of process. And I remember the, um, the white woman saying, now I understand what she, why she's like she is. <laughs> um, so while I had a plan to go along and then invite these two beautiful people up to say something, they have to catch a plane. So in the interest of, um, well, I was trying to work out what a plenary session is and uh, <laughs> there's many different interpretations. But um, Jenny, I saw, summarised what's been going on the last couple of day days this morning when she spoke. And so I thought my job was to um, 
be like Halley's Comet, uh, just appear every 79 years or whatever it is, or, or maybe in reality more like a comet shower, um, because I'll be dashing here and dashing there. So, um, an old man from South Australia said once, if you can't understand an Aboriginal person's silence, you will never understand their words. And I think it's a simple one sentence, but it, when you dig into it, it's quite profound and it's deep. And the writer, Franz Fanon, who I think is a West Indian, writing about Algeria in the book, The Wretched of the Earth, he um, says, speaking of colonisation, and colonisation is certainly a a silent or an ever-present partner or cloud or however you wish to describe it in the discussions, what we go on, what our work is. He said, speaking of colonisation, he says, because it, colonisation, is a systematic negation of the identity of the people it oppresses, it causes them to ask the question of themselves, in reality, who am I? And that's about identity. And what we talk about in our work, you guys with your different programs, identity is a big part of it. Um, so with that as a background, as I was sitting and preparing the way I've been brought up, um, Sandra, her mother and my sister are good mates and it's incumbent upon me to show respect to my sister and her mum and invite her along. But also it's a men's, women's business and my understanding is that when we at conferences like this, you often sit there and say, I wish I had something to say or time to say something or I could say it. So it's important to hear from Sandra and from Michael and Michael and I were chatting before uh, he has something that is really important to say. So um, not only is Sandra's mum my sister's good mate, um, I actually played cricket with her dad. So there's those connections and I would like to invite Sandra and Michael to come up and make their contribution. The wisdom you carry with you, Michael, is always um, really nourishing and those words were really special. Um, yeah, that invisible partner, it really pisses us off, but we see it. We see it weave through all sorts of environments. We see it in people's words. We see it in the spaces between people's words. Um, and we sit in silence listening to that too. And when we decide to speak, you know, we speak with intent. Um, and this is why pragmatically I say, the more of us you get to have contact with, the better off the work will be. Um, as a very good friend of mine, Professor Sandy O'Sullivan, often says, we make everything better. Well, we do it with a bit of occasional strategic humility, but at the end of the day, we do really think we make things better. Um, so my biggest takeaway, I think, is the intergenerational nature of this work and this collective, this community, and as Grant's encouraging us all to think this family. So um, it's been fantastic to meet so many young people um, and to be reminded that I know their mums, just like Michael knows my mum, I know Otis's mum, I know Liam's mum, um, Liam's mum knows my mum. Um, you know, that, that kind of is really important and it, it goes to, as Grant says, our conduct, because we're not one person in this room and a different person in the other parts of our lives. Um, we have to conduct ourselves appropriately. And I think if we can embed those kind of concepts in the way that we work and in the work that we do, um, the work of the commons um, will be um, quite profound and far reach and its impact far reaching. So I'll stop talking now. Thank you for the opportunity.
thanks, Mike, for the invitation to come up. So I guess, I guess, yeah, just quickly talking about, I guess, some of my takeaways about what, why I'm here. I'll, you know, first, I guess, have to acknowledge that I'm, I'm here as, as a museum director. I'm in charge of the, you know, the Anthropology Museum, acknowledging Jane Wilcox sitting here, who's has the even more important responsibility of making sure the database works and people can access access what's in our collection. And I guess as director too, I'm, I'm involved in decisions about whether people can access and access a photo, or access an object, reproduce them, borrow them for exhibitions. And you know, every decision that that Jane and I make as far as access, that, that's it. We take risks, but also acknowledging that I'm m more so here probably as a, as a as a career researcher. You know, I've been working in the area of Abri area, area of Aboriginal history and culture since 1985, so it's nearly 40 years. And I've survived, you know, by researching and doing things with what I find, you know. And I've taken so many risks in publishing photos, exhibiting photos, um, exhibiting objects. Um, I'm here talking right now. I could say something that offends somebody. That's a risk that us all as arts and cultural workers, we take these risks every day of the week. And I think of, you know, artists like Richard Bell, every work he does, he tries to offend people. You know, he tries his hardest. He, and he does it for a reason because a bit of offence every now and again is, you know, is good for discussion. I'm not saying we aim to offend people. I mean, offending is bad, but, but these are the, but it, but it is about risk taking, you know, and we have to quantify those risks that we take. And I think from, you know, from, uh, yeah, talking as an arts and cultural worker, I'm sometimes fearful of bureaucratic policies that take over where risk aversion is the priority. So, you know, so that's, that's I think, the balance that has to be made that, yes, you know, you're talking about big institutions with big collections, yes, really, policies are really important that you get the right policies. But we also have to, you know, provide access. And then if things, if somebody's offended, if something goes wrong, we'll then deal with it and learn from it, not just lock everything up because something might go wrong. So that's my takeaway from this week. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Michael. Um, the image you see before you, um, I've got three. And um, the third one is more of like a liner's blanket, a, a comforter for myself because, you know, like everyone, I'm, I'm nervous. The <clears throat> image came from when I was teaching um, at Kelvin Grove and Macquarie University before that, but UQ. Um, I said to one of my staff who's an artist, I said, I want to, well, I want to give the students a different kind of introduction to the course and I wanted to present them with a bark painting as their course outline to move them away from linear thinking to circular time and so on. And Dr Norm Sheen is the artist and the creator of this image. Um, and he drew that from, and I'm told by Robert there's only two buttons, or Grant was told that. Uh, it came from, if you see the three circles there, um, it came from, it works. Um, this uh, graphic representation of an Aboriginal world view, which is indeed very complex. Uh, the interesting thing is the centrality of land in that image and uh, the two, three rather, human, physical and sacred world and the, the sky, the uh, chocoba and, and the various rules of behaviour and so on. It, it's, it's quite a, a good image and I regret that I uh, never got the provenance of the who, who created this and if anyone can and help me find who created that, um, I'd be delighted to get that information and acknowledge them accordingly. Uh, the other image is um, this beautiful space in my country where we claim it, but it's just off our fence line at the property that uh, my grandfather got back in 1910 uh, through uh, the old Selection Act of the late 1880s, I think. 
and remarkably, uh, he wasn't the only one. There were a number of Aboriginal people around, certainly Queensland, and I'm sure the rest of the country, that acquired land in some way. And in 1910, he was in a lottery, put his name in the hat and got this. Uh, he wanted the property across the other side of the railway line that had a river frontage, and that would have been fantastic. Um, but we consider our, the river our own anyway, and um, the place we've got is... Our, our spiritual home. And when you see Robert and you see Grant operating and their skill and their um, charisma, in my opinion, it does go back to their parents, their grandparents, my uh, father and mother, my grandparent, and the land from which we come. Uh, that is, in my view, consistently evident in how we function and operate. So I'll leave you with that, and if you want to see the um, other images, just tap a uh, signal and I'll go back to it. So, Halley's Comet. It came around in 1986. Uh, it's due in 2061, I think, again. I've promised my daughter that I'll be there watching it with her and more likely I'll be riding its tail than um, actually sitting down and watching. But it also came around in 1910, and my dad was a 13-year-old young man then, and uh, he saw it and he told us about how spectacular it was in the sky, both during the day and during the, the night. Dad also told us about his father, my grandfather, saying to him one time, <coughs> You know that um, old white fellow that came a long time ago in that big boat? Um, speaking of James Cook, <coughs> who landed at what is now called the town of 1770, south of Gladstone, between Gladstone and Bundaberg, which we and the, the local population, the long-term locals, jealously uh, disagree with and still call it Round Hill, uh, but Grandfather said to Dad, he says, when that old fellow come in and landed there, he says, we were watching him. Now, it may not have been Grandfather himself, but it's certainly in our oral tradition. Um, so, reflecting as I was getting prepared before the break uh, and listening to people speaking, it reminded me one day, Jackie Huggins, my good friend and colleague, was sitting in my office at the university, and we worked, I was nearly 20 years as the Director of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies at UQ. And we used to get our early morning cup and yarn up. And uh, a colleague, a psychologist who was working uh, actively in uh, the Indigenous space and very interested in putting together a reconciliation action program for his department, but also took one of his um, products that he'd developed in the area of family um, health and raising of children and so on and so on. He took it to a community in Cape York and he presented. He said, there it is. If you want to use it, give me a call. I'll go away. Call me back. Uh, use all of it, use parts of it, whatever. And he was up and down over the year, the months. And one morning he stuck his head in the office about 8.30 when Jackie and I were there and um, he had this strange look on his face. And he said, because he was a deep thinker and a very honourable person, he said, I was coming back and I jumped on the plane in Cairns, coming back to Brisbane, and he started to ask the question of himself, why he was doing this, what was his motivation. And he spoke about it and when he left, Jackie and I looked at each other and it was one of those pull the little finger moments. And Jackie said, he's finally got it. Now, if you can explain to me what it is in that context, I'd be very delighted because I've pondered all my life what it is in terms of when we work with non-Indigenous people and we listen to them, there's a, I'm sure you're well aware and it's not insulting, 
there's a certain frustration at the lack of connection sometimes. So I hope as we ponder through the activity of data commons over the ensuing years, I can leave that little gem or hopefully idea with you to say, well, what, it is, what is it? What are we talking about? And I've not been able to work it out yet. It's just two letters together, but it's a big problem. So, <clears throat> Halley's Comet, I guess I'm now going to be more like a shower of meteors um, because I'm going to jump here and there and everywhere. Listening to everyone in the last couple of days, I've thought about H. Hass and the data common, Indigenous data commons, is the Hass domain the only domain from which we should approach this? And I, I'm, I'm not saying anything that's new to the people here. I'm hoping I'm simply just putting it back on the agenda. And sometimes you hear things and there's a light bulb moment that um, uh, a, a happens for us. And uh, that's all I'm asking to do. And I do wish, don't wish to insult anyone. So, when I was thinking that, it reminded me of something that frustrated me, and that was in many, many years ago, um, the United Nations talked a lot about the importance of bringing Indigenous people's traditional ecological knowledge to the table, T-E-K. And that irritated me because we have more than ecological knowledge. And we have indigenous knowledge, we have knowledge. And like any human society, we have developed the complete and full intellect. And in the, my experience, I believe that we need to dig deeper. And I would urge that we encourage, and I know the systems and how the bureaucracies work, to have Hass, but also scientists and the hard scientists sitting together more often, I think, would be valuable. Because that then respects Indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples, because I was Googling, and I'll just read from a, a post that came up. It says, First Nations cultures do not typically differentiate between hard and soft sciences in the same way that Western academic traditions do. The distinction between hard and soft sciences is rooted in Western, Western epistemology and methodology, categorising disciplines based on the rigour of empirical methods and the predictability of their findings. In contrast, Indigenous knowledge systems often integrate various forms of knowledge including empirical observations, oral traditions, spiritual teachings and ecological wisdom. Knowledge is often contextualised within relationships, community and the natural environment rather than segmented into distinct categories like hard and soft sciences. In summary, while First Nations cultures may engage with various forms of knowledge that could align with the aspects of both hard and soft sciences in Western terms, they do not typically compartmentalise knowledge in the same way. Instead, Indigenous knowledge systems prioritise interconnectedness, contextuality and community relevance in understanding and utilising knowledge. <clears throat> that then spins me across to a couple of other texts. Um, Blackfoot Physics. There's a book written by a scientist out of the United Kingdom called David Peat, David F. Peat. And he had a fascination with Native American peoples and culture and found himself, I guess he grew up in the era of cowboy and Indian movies and um, I don't know about you guys of my similar age, but... Uh, Sadly, when we were playing cowboys and Indians, we often wanted to be the cowboys rather than the Indians. That's just the curiosity of humanity. But anyway, he found himself in a, a Blackfoot community and um, at one point, 
the community asked him to write about their knowledge in a way that was in depth. Rather like, do you know the book uh, Conversations with Ogotomelli? Um, an Italian anthropologist led a body of research for 15 years into the Dogon people in West Africa and thought they were doing a pretty good job. Had a number of PhDs come out of it and various research papers and so on and so on. And then one day walking home after the day's work, he was pulled aside and they said, look, we know where our life's going to change forever and we want our knowledge written down on our terms. And they sat him down with this old man for several days, Ogotomelli, and it just blew his mind. He says, I was only, we were only scratching the surface during those 15 years. So in the context of data commons, I think we keep, have to keep reminding ourselves of that and how the culture and the society of the academy that we come from uh, socialises us into a, a space where we don't, we, we need to sit and say, well, who am I? What am I? How am I being too influenced by that? How can I be a maverick and move outside of it? I think that's one of our challenges. In that context, I'd also like to talk about I'll finish off the Blackfoot Physics, and that connects to the work that we were doing at UQ. There was a Native American man who was like a stolen generation, finding his way back into the community and his culture. And, well, gee was time's running out. Well, how much longer do I have, timekeeper? 10, 15 minutes? Yes, I know people have, oh, yeah, I saw all the bags out there, I thought they'd be all gone, yeah. Another five minutes, yeah. Um, so, a song came into his brain, you know, you get that song comes in and you can't get rid of the film thing, it just keeps rolling around, rolling, he says, oh, well, next time, I'm going to a sweat lodge shortly, um, it'll probably be sung there, and... He went to the sweat lodge, came out, it wasn't sung, and he was frustrated, and he chatted to this old man, senior, man sitting down there, and he said, he said, the old fellow said, look, sing it. So he sang that song, and he said, ah, oh, that's old Joe's song. He died 30 years ago. It must have been tired of waiting around. And one of the contentions that we came up with with the work that we did, Norm Sheen and colleagues, Jackie, Sam Watson, and others in our work at UQ and, and in collaboration with colleagues from across the world various times, is that knowledge, Indigenous knowledge, does not need the vehicle of human intervention to move through time. It, can, it has its own soul and spirit. And in the context of what we're doing, I think that's um, something that we need to ponder in terms of how we can shift the space that we inhabit before we go into the field, go into the desk, go into the computer and work this material through. Two staff from my unit went, one an Aboriginal Norm Sheen in fact, and a Native American woman went to a conference in Albuquerque, invited by Native American scholars and um, it's a classic sitting in a circle. If you're invited to the inner circle, you had to speak. If you were invited to the outside, you had to listen and you were invited in and then you could speak and there was a talking stick and so on. Um, there were black and white scholars and there were two quantum physicists. And at one point, one of them said, when you speak of the quantum, our language and our paradigms, that of the quantum physicists' world, had taken them as far as they could go and they were coming to Indigenous scholars to look further. And to me, I think that's very important for us to consider beyond the TEK idea at the really profound knowledge base that Indigenous First Nations communities provide and the potential that's there for us as a society 
and the data commons activity is an important uh, activity within that understanding. We need to keep that in mind. Um, I'm conscious of time. I guess there's only one other point I'd like to certainly include. When I was on the Council of the Institute, IATSIS and its former iteration, AIAS, Australian Institute of Aboriginal Studies, I was at one stage the title holder for the longest serving council member and then old brother Bob Tonkinson, God rest his soul, passed recently. Uh, he got the title from me. Um, we were in a conference uh, meeting over in Perth and we were visiting the Burnt Museum. And um, the principal at the time was standing next to me and he was from Perth and he whispered to me, there's sacred material on display here or secret objects. And I just turned around and walked out. And then I raised it, of course. Um, I'm not all that cheeky, but sometimes I can be. And uh, I was slapped over the wrist for questioning the decision of and respect to old Ron. Uh, but I think it's a pretty simple process that while that knowledge was, that, 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 that um, item may have been approved and declared okay to display by the people that uh, Ron worked with, there are other people associated with that knowledge that may not be so comfortable. And to me, a simple process would be to put it in another room, say it's there, and if you choose to go there, rather like the uh, controversy over climbing Uluru. There's a sign there, don't climb it. You have then the, the decision to make as to whether you do or you don't. So I could go on for another 10 or 15 minutes, but I think in the interest of time and the opportunity for some of you who uh, will be moving along soon, can we, Grant, where are you? Um, open it to some discussion, response, or however. Thank you. Any discussion or response or questions? Any rotten tomatoes? <laughs> Leon. Uh, uh, Leon. L I M. What the front tomatoes at me for? There's one down here. <laughs> Maggie. Maggie. Call Maggie me. Thank you. Uncle Michael, I just wanted to say thank you for those. I think they were just such important words to end this three days with. And so for, for just bringing your um, wisdom and your knowledge here and being here with us all as we're kind of on this journey, um, you know, we, we go back a very long way and it's um, it's just very, yeah, it means a lot to me that you're here closing this. So many thanks. There's a couple of thank yous online as well for you as well, though, saying... Thank you very much to that grey-headed old fella for... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Somebody no. said they wanted closed captioning because they wanted to be able to absorb the words as they were hearing it. Ah, very interesting. Now, it's always a pleasure to... Um, like, I, I sit and I listen to Uncle Mike talk, and I know that he sits there, but he's listening all the time. And I know that when he gets up and speaks, it's from here but it's very highly astute, culturally astute, um, and someone I've always admired in the context of what I do. Um, but at the same time, I can give him cheek whenever I like. <laughs> but publicly, he's my uncle. But privately, he my nightmare sometimes. But, no. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's been a pleasure to have you here as always. And of course, Robbie knows the story as well. So, yeah, thank you. And can I just say on that note that... Uh, um, acknowledging Grant and Robbie, of course, and um, all of you in the sense that um, as I've listened to the last few days, um, 
As I said, I'm Haley's Comet. I come in, I've been a long time since I've been out of the game, so to speak. I retired, quote unquote, in 1910. And I um, uh, revisit, like Haley's Comet, um, and I keep a sort of an eye on things and an ear open, but, um, or I open an ear on things. Um, and I wanted to say to all of you that um, you should applaud yourselves. So. Thank you. Thank you. And um, all but a wrap, and I know we've got to cut scrub. Cut scrub, you know, we'll just leave. Um, Kit, I'd like you to come up, if you don't mind. Where's Kit? Hiding. Come here, Kit. <laughs> Yee, Kit, 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 Kit. <laughs> and can you bring your team up as well, yes, Kit? Please. Thank you very much. Please. It's always a pleasure to uh, come on, Nicole. Nicole. Nicola. <laughs> Judy, Shubra, Liam, Vianniqua, uh, Tom, L I M, Tom, and I know there's not as many people here that uh, as was before, but one of the things, my job's easy, believe it or not, but for me to do what I do, it's important to acknowledge the efforts that's always behind the scenes. Now, I can't do what I do without the deadly team of people. And I think we all owe them a, a round of applause and appreciation. So thank you, Kit. And the AV. And the AV team. So thank you very much. And uh, unless you want to say anything, Kit and Tom. Uh, go on, Tom. I'll just quickly say thank you to the kind people for turning up. Uh, and, you know, a commons is not a commons without the people within it. And thank you for being a part of the Commons. Thank you.